Who got your uh, tax credit money this year? Good afternoon, and welcome to the Tempe City Council work study session for April 6th here in the Huron E. Mitchell Government Center. Um, first item on our agenda uh, is a call to the audience for the issue review uh, session items. Audience members have up to three minutes to address the City Council. If you would like to speak on an item, uh, you can fill, please fill out your speaker's card, which is in the back of the room. Please come forward and hand it to our city clerk, and I'll call your name, and it's your turn to speak. Um, I do just want to uh, uh, announce and, and recognize former Mayor Neil Giuliano is here with us. Neil, welcome. Back in the, the old council chambers. Um, with that, I do have some public appearance cards, and the first one is former Mayor Neil Giuliano. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. It's good to see you all. Um, I'm here tonight to talk uh, briefly on issue 2B, which is the streetcar project update. Um, I looked over the uh, staff report, which was uh, well done, thoroughly done, as the staff always does in partnership with Valley Metro. And the particular concern that I have is the topic of off-wire scenarios for downtown Tempe, which is great, except the streetcar doesn't stay in downtown Tempe. The streetcar comes further south and goes around the Gamage Curve and heads a little bit east. And so, and there does not appear to be any scenarios presented that would include a review of or discussion of or consideration of an option of going off wire around the Gamage Curve. And I would only ask you to consider for two things about that. One, Gamage is I think clearly the most architecturally significant building in the city of Tempe, and I would even argue probably the most significantly architectural building in the region, if not one of the few, the handful in the state of Arizona. And I think some extra consideration should be given for that. And number two, there are 21 uh, single family homes, full disclosure, mine is one of those, that face either east across Mill Avenue or south across the curve and 13th Street. And when I looked at all this and saw that there were, first of all, it's called only the scenarios for downtown and the streetcar doesn't stay in downtown, it goes south of downtown a little bit. Um, and the homes that are in that area and Gamage, uh, and I didn't see, I looked kind of in the back kind of story of this and it didn't seem like there was ever a, a council discussion or option about uh, going off wire um, around the Gamage Curve, roughly from 11th Street around the curve to Forest uh, or a college, but you probably wouldn't need to go far. I don't know the details. I don't know the engineering. I don't know all of that uh, kind of information, um, but I didn't see a conversation or a discussion about that kind of an option, so I thought I would bring it to your attention and, and let you all consider that. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Ernie Nichols. Welcome back, Mr. Nichols. It's been a while. Please state your name and place of residence for the record. Uh, Ernie Nichols, 322 East Broadway Lane. Uh, I'm here to, uh, first, I'd like to thank the mayor and the council for the new eight foot high masonry wall out in front of our house. It's very nice. It's really changed our lifestyle. We look at a blank wall, true, but we're not looking at all the traffic. So uh, thank you. And then we're also enjoying the Palverde, Wilming Palverdes out on Broadway. So you guys did a good job. Uh, I'm here primarily on the setting speed limits uh, between Ruhr Road and Mill. I'd like for you to consider uh, reducing that speed limit to 25. Uh, 35, excuse me, 35 instead of the 40. Uh, Broadway, as you probably noticed, is very heavily used, and most of the time you can't drive 40 miles an hour anyway. So uh, uh, it does affect a lot of other things by having it 35 rather than 40. Because uh, College Avenue and Broadway, that is a very busy street, pedestrian and bicycle. Uh, so I'd like for you to consider that, so thank you. Thank you. Next is Zach Debreen. 
Debrini? Did I pronounce that correctly? Debray? Debray? Oh, it looks like I'm there. Thank you for seeing me. Um, I actually had a couple questions regarding item 2D, the 5th Street Streetscape uh, traffic Um Over after I was reading the, the presentation, I saw that they're basically increasing the numbers of like shade and stuff by 15% or by a certain percentage. And I'm wondering where um, those initial numbers are coming from um, and kind of what data sets are being considered in coming up with those numbers and if those data sets are available to the public right now. Okay. So. We'll get you that information. Thank you. Yeah. Next, Mr. Martinez. Mario Martinez. Good evening, uh, or good afternoon, Mayor and members of the council. I am here, <clears throat> excuse me. My name is Mario Martinez. I live and work in Tempe. My children go to school here. Speaking as a Tempe resident, taxpayer and voter, I'd like to say that we need uh, uh, municipal services that are professionally performed by qualified municipal employees. I am speaking in regards to uh, item uh, 2C, which is the code of conduct, and I'd like you to consider the following information. When a woman in my neighborhood is tragically murdered in a domestic violence situation, and the authorities determine <coughs> that the child in that domestic relationships attends the same school as my children. Who are the ones that make sure that the, uh, children's are, are, the children are safe while the suspect is still at large? Was it the Tempe police in conjunction with the Tempe uh, 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 zone personnel? Or was it Kobe Granville? Or is Kobe Granville the same council member who votes to outlaw sitting on the sidewalk and then turns right around and tells the uh, citizens to violate the same law in order to evaluate the police enforcement equity for this ignorant idea. When a person experiences a life-threatening medical emergency while shopping in Tempe, who are the individuals who, uh, uh, who, are the individuals who help this individual get medical attention? Was it the Tempe firefighter uh, 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 paramedics or was it Kobe Granville? Or is Kobe Granville the same council member who constantly disparaged the unions that the firefighters freely choose to join? Okay, in the current report by the outside council, Kobe is quoted as using fecal expletives to abuse the city legal staff in what is supposed to be, I emphasize supposed to be, a professional legal meeting. Okay, in these meetings, can a member of the city legal staff use fecal expletives to describe Kobe's legal opinions? Of course not, but that is exactly what Kobe does when he routinely abuses our city employees. This is wrong. Kobe has a history of mistreating our well-qualified city employees and acting in a sleazy fashion. If Kobe violated the code of conduct, I respectfully demand that this duplicitous public official finally be held accountable for his abusive actions by the rest of the city council. Thank you. Okay. Next is uh, Cass Olmsted. Did I pronounce that correctly? Is it Pardon me? Did I pronounce that correctly, Olmsted? I did. Okay. So I came in today because I wanted to talk to a council about the speed limits around the high schools. In Tempe, our speed limit is 35 miles an hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. I think it's overkill. I, I don't have any problem. If you go to other cities, they have flashing lights, speed limit 35 or 25 or whatever it is when the light is blinking. So I'm trying to figure out why Tempe feels it needs to be 365 days a year at midnight when obviously there are no high school students present. It's you know, I was PTO president at Corona for like eight years. I was there when we closed the campus. 
Um, we have closed campuses, so it's not like the kids are in and out all day long, crossing the road. They can't leave the campus until they're coming or going from school. So I'd like the council to reconsider. I think it's an inconvenience to our citizens to do that 365 days a year. Thank you. That's all the cards I have. Is there anyone else in the audience wishing to address us on any of the items listed under the issue review session? Could you please get my attention? Seeing none, I'll close that portion of the meeting. The next item on our agenda is item 2A, which is code of conduct. Um, are you going to present or we're just going to? I would be happy. Mr. Shields? on it's not going green oh, there it is um, I'd be happy to present okay. a summary of what I was retained to do and what my conclusions were okay or or address any questions that the council has whichever you prefer Just do a brief explanation of what was done and then we can have a council discussion Before that, Mayor, I yes I just I don't know and I just defer to you uh, from a conflict of interest standpoint should I be here or should I not be here do I have a conflict of interest? I just, I, I, I candidly don't know, so I'm just deferring to you what I should do. Got it. Um, I, I believe your presence is fine, but I do believe you have a conflict of interest in terms of um, rendering any sort of vote or input as to um, what should be done in response to the investigation. Okay. So do I get to speak but not vote because we don't vote here? Um, I do not believe that this is the proper venue for you to speak as far as factually what happened because that was what the investigation is about sure. um, so guess, so for example so mr Schitz, can I, you come down to this chair right here thank I you i appreciate that mark i'm mayor it's <laughs> mark's mayor <laughs> we're in a meeting To answer your question, first of all, clearly there's a conflict of interest. There's a state statute that says that if you have a vested interest in the outcome of an event really like this. Hear. Speak into the microphone. Okay. So, um, first of all, there's a state statute on You can point. just look at us. You don't have to worry about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there's a TV screen. Yeah. I need to sw swivel. Um, Somewhere over there. No, don't swivel. Don't, don't swivel. swivel. Look straight. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. There is a state statute that says that if you have a vested interest in the outcome of this, you, you can't render a vote. Um, as to whether um, now is, a good, is an opportunity for you to um, um, explain to the council certain um, viewpoints you have as to why. Um, I assume that if I had a conflict of interest, I assume during the call to the audience would have been the time for me to do that. I think, for example, uh, previously, uh, Councilwoman Ellis, when she would have a conflict of interest, uh, in E session or something, she would get up and leave E session. And so she just wouldn't even be there. And so I don't know if I should just not even be here or if I'm, I, I just don't know. That's why I'm asking. No, I think it's a fair question. I think it, it's your prerogative as to whether you should be here. It's okay. clear to me the estate statute, you, you cannot vote on what um, should ensue in connection with okay. the That conduct. also I assume means that I should not speak. I believe it would be inappropriate for you to speak okay. because that's fine. I just wasn't sure what I was supposed to do. Okay, okay. There, there, there's no clear-cut law on that that I'm aware of. Okay, but um, the purpose of the investigation was for me to conduct the fact-finding, render the fact-finding to the board, apply the facts um, to the code of conduct and to the ethics handbook, and so that's been done. Okay. Then if I could ask one more question, ma'am. Yes. Then I, I would defer to this body. It's up, you know, it's up to you all. What you would prefer, I'm happy to do. Councilmember uh, Keating, then Councilmember McKeeby, then Councilmember Shapiro. Um, it, it seems to me, though, that Councilman Granville should be allowed to defend himself or you know, say something in defense of himself. Though, I mean, I don't. Uh, to to I, I get not being able to like it, it, like sway the vote or be able to vote in the actual decision, but to at least give his point of view to be able to speak, I think would be appropriate in my mind. Councilmember Kubey. And I had that same concern that um, wouldn't we want to hear from him if we're trying to come to a consensus about what action to take? But if you think it's legally not permissible. I, I don't think it's legally impermissible at all. Um, the, the 
concern would be um, that you're going to be hearing facts from Mr. Granville um, that the other individuals who were interviewed are not going to have a chance to respond to. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, the memo. but, you know, I, it's your prerogative. There's, I don't see, there's, there's no ordinance on point. There's no statute on point. Mm -hmm. um, the only statute that is, that is clearly on point to me is the one that prohibits Mr. Granville from, from actually voting as to mm -hmm. what the outcome should be. That satisfies me there. <clears throat> Councilman Shapiro. <clears throat> and Mayor, I, I think it's just important to reiterate that we're not actually going to vote on anything tonight. So there would be no potential for violating said statute. I mean, that's, I, I'm not, I don't know if you're familiar with our work study sessions, but we don't actually vote. But, but just a, a quick question or, or to your point, um, I can understand not wanting to, my, my, my question was, can we ask him questions? And certainly I can, I can understand the piece about not wanting to ask fact-based fact questions about the incident that occurred. But if we wanted to ask other questions relating to, you know, his mens rea or, or you know, how he feels about the situation or what his, um, you know, what he, what he feels about the potential dispositions, those questions would not be things that would even be appropriate for the other people to respond to. It, are those types of questions and his answers to those questions perhaps more appropriate than fact-based questions? I believe so, because in the summary memo that I prepared for you, there's various um, actions you can take that are short of censure. And I think, aptly put, Mr. Granville's mens rea is relevant to which of those options you decide to, to pursue. Thank you. Councilman Navarro? Uh, no, and I, I kind of leave it up to Colby what his comfort is on this. Um, I, I, I um, just listened to the council, uh, you know, not having everyone here to ask those questions on various things, that, that kind of worries me if only we get one side and not other side. So I'm kind of a little bit, uh, to your point, uh, Councilmember Shapira, I, I don't know if I can agree with um, just hearing one side, I guess, because it as a perception to the public, it looks like we're just treating on one side. Can you please introduce yourself for the record? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a good idea. Uh, my name is Burr Shields. I'm an employment lawyer here in Phoenix. Been at it for about 30 years, and I was retained in January to conduct the investigation in regards to the incident on January 11th. Thank you. Vice Mayor Arredondo Savage. No, thank you, Mayor. I guess I, I would just say a couple things in regards to I, I agree with uh, Council Member Navarro that you know, we did seek outside counsel, and I really do appreciate uh, the input and uh, the investigation that you conducted. I know it was fair and equitable there at the time, and I do worry about just being able to hear one other side to that um, moving forward. So I think based on the facts that we have before us, you know, I'm confident that we can have some really solid discussion and then figure out what our action will be moving forward. So thank you for that. Okay. So what we have before us, there was an outside investigation that was done. It was presented to us by Mr. Shields. And the way our process worked, we have it in, it's, it's, um, we passed an ordinance back in 2009 of a code of conduct that was signed uh, by then former Mayor uh, Hugh Holman. And we have a workflow chart of what happens when we, when there is an issue that arises, it goes through the process and ultimately comes back to the city council. And that's what's been uh, described for us. There was an investigation. Um, so there's some options that we have in our memorandum, our memo, of what happened on January 11th. It's an investigation. Um, I could, Mayor, just if there is a potential conflict of interest, I, I, I would rather not be sitting here because if there's a conflict, I shouldn't be sitting here in my mind. That's that's my only thing is. You know what, Councilman Bravo, I, I honestly agree with you, but that's okay. up to you. You're, no, no, you're the only one that can make that no, choice. No, out of an abundance of caution, I'd, I'd rather, there's a potential for a conflict, and I don't want to be sitting at a conflicted table, uh, but I, I will be back shortly, or not shortly. I guess that's up to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have, the, the, we have the memo before us. There was an investigation done concerning this matter. There's a report that was dated February 16th. <clears throat> after conducting various interviews. There was a conclusion to the report from uh, Mr. Shields, and I don't know if you could state the conclusion sure. and then list the different options. Yes, Council Member um, Mr. Shields, before you go into that, I think it's important to note for the public that um, this issue didn't come to Council and we made a decision to investigate that it was, get to that it, was, it was driven by our internal processes and 
we first learned about it when the investigation was complete. So to, to Councilman McCubey's point, when I talked about the process, there was an incident that happened in uh, January 11, 2017, uh, regarding Councilmember Granville and some city staff. With that being taken place, um, from that meeting, there was some discomfort. So then a complaint was processed through our process. Um, an investigation resulted from that complaint. And now we are here today to discuss the facts of that complaint and that investigation. And the appropriate sanctions. And the appropriate measures to take as we move forward. Correct. And if, I, I'd be happy to go over any aspects. I can start from scratch and summarize it within a couple minutes. That would so, be helpful. Um, sure. So my first communication with the city was um, um, via a memo on January 27th. I then uh, met with the deputy city attorney to learn what the, the issue was and the scope of my investigation. It was at that point that I was provided with various documents, including the Tempe City Charter, um, the resolution 2009.126 that you referenced, Mayor, and the, the City of Tempe's Ethics in Our Workplace Manual. So my first tax was, I was told that the event occurred on January 11, 2007, during a work study session, and my first tax was to figure out what happened, who said what. Um, I then, I interviewed um, five of the seven people that were present, um, four of which I interviewed in person. And my conclusions as to what was said at the meeting were really, um, there was no issue of fact. Um, everybody was on the same page as to what happened, including Mr. Granville. And what happened was this. Um, a discussion ensued between Mr. Granville and a representative of the city attorney's office. Um, it went back and forth. I think the consensus was for about 30 minutes and it got contentious and at one point um, Mr. Granville used an expletive in reference to the opinion that the assistant city attorney was rendering. That made the assistant city attorney feel as I uh, mentioned in my report uh, humiliated that her, um, um, that her reputation was being trashed in front of the attendees and she also feared, the, the city attorney also feared retribution um, if for opposing the conduct. So those facts are, are uncontested. It's not a complicated situation factually. Applying those facts then to the resolution which adopts by reference the um, ethics in our workplace handbook, I was asked to render an opinion as to whether a violation of anything in those documents occurred and I concluded yes. And in a nutshell, and this is in my summary, um, the conclusion was that um, Mr. Granville treated the assistant city attorney um, in a disrespectful and um, disparaging manner. And that violates the various provisions of the Ethics Center work, work, Workplace Handbook. It violates um, the, an actual provision in, sec, in Tempe City of the Tempe personnel rules, which are adopted by um, resolution 406, or excuse me, section 406B3, which is incorporated into the resolution. Bottom line, abusive attitude, language, behavior, disrespectful conduct towards a staff member um, is prohibited according to those documents. And that was the conclusion in a nutshell. Um, from there, um, I explain in my initial report of February 16th and then the subsequent sort of truncated memo that I prepared for you, that the maximum penalty the council can impose is formal censure and that would have to be accomplished via resolution. There are lesser forms of, of sanction that the council can impose, um, a letter of concern or a letter of reprimand and the criteria for those are actually because there's no ordinance on point, I borrowed the criteria for those lesser forms of discipline from the Arizona Medical Board, which deals with these types of situations on a regular basis. And so the range in terms of options, do nothing, letter of concern, letter of reprimand, formal censure. There's, if you wanna be creative and think of something in between one of those four categories, certainly nothing in the law that prohibits it. 
but as far as some precedent on which to base your opinion, um, I think those, those would be the four options. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Kubey. So I do have a question for you, Mr. Shields. Sure. So um, in, um, this is a redact, some redacted information, but a publicly released um, memorandum. You mentioned communicating with Chuck Cahoy. He's uh, one of our city attorneys. I also learned that four City of Tempe employees have expressed concerns to the supervisors about Mr. Granville's treatment of them. One such complaint appears to have been informally resolved through internal mediation. The other three individuals did not believe Mr. Granville's conduct was sufficiently egregious so as to warrant the participation in this investigation. Since some of the recommended actions involve repetitive behavior, can that information be considered in our discussion, or should it not be since it hasn't been, they haven't been investigated by you or so in this process? It's, it's clearly hearsay, and in an administrative setting, hearsay is not admissible, but, it's, but hearsay is not per se inadmissible, but you consider it for, you can consider it for whatever weight you want to give it. Um, I think that that's somewhat unreliable information because those people did not want to participate um, in the investigation itself. Um, yeah, I think it's reasonable to conclude that they did at some point complain because that information came to me through the city attorney. And I think it strains credibility that the city attorney would make that up, frankly. Um, and but. What we tried to do, or what I tried to do, is if there indeed was a pattern, provide those who um, experienced similar conduct with the opportunity to participate, and they declined. So I think that's telling. And so I would take that portion of my report much less strongly than the description of what happened from those who actually attended that meeting. And the reason, um, the reason you, were, you were hired to do this investigation, that was because the, the person that was making the complaint was in the city attorney's office, and the city attorney's, city attorney's office would typically be the agent of invest, doing the investigation, so that's why you were brought in? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Councilman Schreiber. Just one quick follow-up question, Mayor. You said <clears throat> that that's telling, and I think you said other things to sort of describe what you mean by that, by that, but I would just like some clarification when you say it's telling. What do you mean by that? Uh, good question. Um, I think that it, so one of the criteria um, that you must analyze is how serious is the conduct, both on July, or excuse me, on January 11th and at some other time. I would contend that since the what I meant by telling is that if those people viewed the conduct as egregious or serious, one inference is that they would want to participate, and they chose not to. So, and, I, and I'm just, as, as a lawyer who tries and arbitrates cases, that level of hearsay I don't think should be given considerable weight. Councilman Navarro? Uh, just a uh, question. If through the process, and obviously I don't think we decide tonight, but through the process, um, behavior consi uh, still consists or still um, goes on, and it is, is what we do tonight just, and if this topic were to come up again, is it the same process or does it go to another level? Um, if, if, if the conduct was of a similar nature, meaning mistreatment of a staff member, you'd be going through this process again. That's what the resolution provides. And Councilman to, to Councilman Navarro's point, I, and I, I just want to clarify this, my understanding is that the highest penalty that this council could um, dispense with to a fellow council member is censure. And so even if they're... Formal censure. And so, if if if, uh, the, if we were to go through this process again, God forbid, formal censure would still be the highest penalty. It's not like there's escalating right, penalties. Right, right. That's that, why I wanted, I wanted clarity on. Yeah, I think that's that's a good question. Thank, thank you for asking. Oh, 
And one, Kibbe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. One thing I think is important when looking at, and I know this is a medical board, um, we don't have any precedent for this in Arizona, in Tempe, but it says the issue, activity issue does not involve issues of serious moral or ethical lapses in conduct or repetitive, repetitive issues. So um, it's... What's my interpretation of that? Yeah, maybe. Can, can, I, can I grab it? I'd yeah. love so they're separate. Mm -hmm. um, how serious was it? And is it repetitive? Mm -hmm. Two separate criteria for you to consider. Um, and I think to the councilman's point, mens rea is an important consideration when you assess the seriousness. You know. Um, and can you define mens rea for us? State of mind. Unlegal um, scholars. No, state of mind. <laughs> yeah. You know. Okay. Um, and and it does. You know. You can take a look at it from a couple different perspectives to use that terminology in that setting implies a state of mind. And so you're going to have to use your own sort of judgment as uh, almost like a quasi-juror to decide where on the seriousness spectrum that lands. Mm -hmm. what, was, what was actually said, what was the purpose of being said, and then um, whether there's re repetitive conduct <coughs> like this I don't think the evidence in my report is strong on that point because all we have is are some hearsay allegations that have not been substantiated. Did I answer your question? I'm not trying to yes. step That's around. Our, and then and maybe for the city manager, is there is the city manager still a hearsay if, if complaints do come to the city manager uh, about conduct of any council member? Is that hearsay? Yeah, okay. I believe that you. The council is restricted to what's in my report okay. as to this decision making process. Are we restricted um, to the report to think about repetitive issues, though? If, if we've witnessed a repetitive uh, an issue, say in a council meeting, is that something we can consider in our decision? If we witness disrespectful behavior towards an employee in a formal council meeting, would that qualify as rep repetitive? You personally experienced something along these or lines just witnessed it or witnessed it mm -hmm. I think that's fair game for I don't think it's appropriate for a discussion mm -hmm. at this point okay but you know like famous case says you're not required to undergo a lobotomy just because you make a decision so the information that's in your head can guide you as to um, the mm -hmm. seriousness of this particular offense and whether it, it is indeed repetitive. I don't think that's appropriate for a discussion, though, at all, because um, that was not part of the investigation. Mm -hmm. Councilman Shapiro. I have a question to that point. Um, so if we are to consider our own experiences as individuals, and our own recollections as individuals, aren't we then, as a panel, making decisions based on different sets of evidence, and is that okay? Um, I think... It is okay because what you're here to assess is is repetitiveness and seriousness, and how can you, you know, um, wipe out your own memories in that regard? Mm -hmm. So it's it's a common sense response to your question as opposed to a legal one. Mm -hmm. All right, let me just try to bring some of the stuff together. You know. We often say, you know, Tempe is a community that cares. We have a, an anti-discrimination ordinance, and we have a code of conduct. I mean, we take great pride in, as a city of Tempe, their employees. Yesterday, uh, Council Member uh, QB and I, with the work of Council Member Shapiro and Vice Mayor Erdano Savage, we had an equal pay um, celebration, and we celebrate our diversity. We celebrate our inclusiveness. We celebrate how we treat one another, and that's what's known at Tempe whether it's inside the city hall or outside the city hall, this is what Tempe is known for. And, and it's unfortunate that we're in the position we're in right now. However, what's before us was an investigation. It was a complaint driven by a city employee. Who f that individual felt there was something that they weren't treated properly. An investigation is before us. We have it. We have some alternatives um, of what we can do to the extent that Council Member Shapiro mentioned and Council Member Navarro. The, 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 the maximum issue that we can do is, is a formal censure. 
it's up to us to figure out what that lies in. And then there's also a letter of reprimand and there's a letter of uh, advisory letter. And there's something that we can look at. Or we can come up with something different. That, that's up to this body. Um, I think based on the information that we have, not doing our own, talking to individuals, that's not what we're supposed to do because this was an outside investigation with the materials presented to us mm -hmm. that we have before us some alternatives or some choices for us to make if we do wish to move forward. And I would look to the council regarding the information that's before us to see where this council would like to go in relates to this issue regarding this investigation. Councilmember Kiwi. So, um, I mean, do we want to start from do nothing and see where we feel about that and just, and then. I mean, obviously something this. happened. So right, right, it, it, right. we can't so, take this lightly because it came to this level. Right, With right. that being so said, this is the first time this happened. But it's also a colleague of ours and we understand that we, we can't treat anybody any differently. Exactly. And we hold our employees to the same standard. You know, it, so that's important too. I think that's a good strategy. Vice, Vice Mayor Adano Savage. I'm totally fine with that, Mayor. Or, you know, I I would definitely say we have to do something, and I would support the idea of, of us kind of do, trying to decide what that action is moving forward. And I too feel like the Mayor said. I think this organization is a remarkable organization, and we have some of the highest caliber staff members. And I think we need to hold ourselves to the highest standard um, when it comes to inclusiveness, fairness, and respect, not just for each other, but also for our staff that work really hard every single day. And for anybody to fear that their job might be in jeopardy because they cannot tell us that there is an issue or a concern, I mean, to me, that's a problem. So I do support doing something. I'm, and if I had to say, I would actually also X out the letter of concern. Mayor? Yes, Councilman. I would like to also um, second that thought. I mean, it's. it's you don't want to see this happen, and this is, hasn't happened in Tempe to date, and it's, and it's disturbing. And um, when we talk about seriousness, we, we know that the person who, is, who felt victimized um, feared losing her job, excuse me, feared losing his or her job, <laughs> uh, that felt that the council member had trashed his or her reputation um, and felt you know, humiliated. So we can't second guess that person's feelings. Um, I feel the advisory letter when you read, and I know that we're, we don't have to go by the medical board. Um, we, can, you know, we can scrap that and come up with our own system, our own protocol. But when you look at the advisory letter, and this is one, one protocol we can consider, it, it pretty much says there's kind of insufficient evidence to support the action. And we know from the investigation that there is evidence. So I feel like number A, advisory letter A, does not apply. And that the violation is minor or technical and not sufficient to warrant the action, to me that that does not apply either. Because if you look at the flow chart, it says if, if there's, it's determined to be um, a violation, a non-charter violation, then you vote for sanction up to public censure. So to me, the advisory letter is, is not sufficient to, uh, not a sufficient action for tonight. But that's my opinion. Sure. How do you all feel about that, about the advisory letter? And I expected as a letter of concern, which I'm just saying. Councilman Navarro? Uh, no, with that, and I think just to follow up with Councilman Kubi, Kubi, it was, I believe in the report, it was agreed by five uh, people that were interviewed. The one, two, and even three, four, five. That what happened, and even with Councilman Granville admitting it did take place, and then with the uh, uh, report from the employee that was uh, tar uh, addressed to. Um, I agree with what's said. Um, I, I think my, my approach would be either the, the two, the sanction or the letter of reprimand. Um, and I don't know if a public apology is part of that or has to be part of that, um, but uh, that is something to consider possibly. Um, just throwing it out there. Councilman Shapiro. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> I agree with my colleagues. Uh, first, that uh, this is something, as Councilmember Granville has stipulated, that certainly occurred. There's no question as to whether or not it occurred and whether or not what was alleged to have been said was actually said. So there's not really a fact in question there. Um, and so our, you know, our, our consideration is sort of what level of repercussion we should exercise. And so I agree that um, xing out the 
nothing uh, option makes sense. Um, I also uh, agree with Councilmember Navarro that whatever outcome we decide should include an apology. The only part I might depart from is whether it should be public or private. Frankly, he owes an apology to one person, <laughs> you know. And so whether it's done standing at a lectern or uh, in a letter individually to that person or even directly to that person, if that person were to be okay with that, obviously that would be their option. Um, I don't really have a preference between those. I think that's, um, but, but I, I don't think necessarily the public apology. I think that's more of just like a publicity thing or as, you know, it's not really uh, getting to the point that getting to the root of the matter. So um, I do think there should be a, an apology included and I, and I do think that the no penalty should be off the table. Okay. Councilmember Keating. Uh, I'm in agreement with uh, my colleagues that we can remove, of course, the do nothing action and the uh, letter of concern, or was it the advisory, advisory, advisory letter? letter. Um, letter you know, and I also agree with uh, Councilmember Shapira and uh, Councilmember Navarro that an apology should be included, but I'm fine with a private apology. Okay, so I think where we are is the letter of reprimand. If you can help us draft that, and we'd have to come back to this body so that we can approve that letter. Yeah, what, uh, in speaking with Ms. Blaine before the meeting, um, the procedure would be, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sonia, but um, we could, I could draft that for you, return at a subsequent meeting, and we could um, refine the language. And the only thing, and, and this is unfortunate, hopefully this doesn't happen again. Um, I think the consensus is that we look for a letter of reprimand. We'll wait to hear back from you, Mr. Shields, on that so we can get that agendized and put this behind us. The only thing I would caution is, this does affect not just individuals involved. I think it's bigger than that. I think it affects our organization of what is allowed, what's not allowed, especially given the climate today. Um, and this really shows that we, we're not going to tolerate this, that we hold ourselves accountable, which is why this process is in place to begin with. So I think it, it, it's not just to the individuals that are involved. It does affect, I think, outside, um, especially our employees, but also the image that we have with, within the city, as I stated earlier, the city of Tempe. You know, we, we are a city that cares and a community that cares. And it's important that um, we treat everybody with respect. And that's basically what we're asking for. So with that being said, there is, Councilman Spire? Yeah, Mayor, to, to that point, I, I guess I should have clarified. I, it's not that I'm necessarily opposed to the public apology. I just think the private apology, the direct apology to the person is the most important piece. And oh, absolutely. So I, I, I want to make sure that that's included as a piece of this or wherever we land. Yeah, and I'm fine with the private, but I'm, I'm saying the comment that was made about this, doesn't, this only affects some individuals. I think it affects more than that. That's why we're where we are. And, 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 and today's and point, and that's, and that's why I brought it up. We are public officials. We say things in the public. We do things in the public. We take the targets. We take the hits. That's why I, I brought up the public um, apology. I uh, personally, yeah, uh, an apology to the, to the person that is, is needed. Um, but we are sitting in these seats and you got to take ownership. And to that point, we're going to move forward. Employees are responsible with their managers and their supervisors. As elected officials, our supervisors are our constituents, our residents. So that's where I think we fall into that. We're going to, yes, Vice Mayor. No, I, I just want to say too, I mean, one thing I, don't, I just want to make sure that we're clear about, and I think this is just maybe a message to our Tempe family that it really does matter. We want everybody to enjoy their job and come to work because they love the city of Tempe and want to be a part of it and continue to work hard and not feel that you're belittled or undermined by any means. And if there's an issue or concern that you can certainly bring it forward and something will happen. And that's exactly why we're here today. So we minimize the repetitiveness of, of inappropriate actions. And I certainly agree that we have to hold ourselves accountable and to the highest standards. So just to wrap up so we can have Mr. Shields get some information to us. The advisory letter is not there. The, the do nothing option is not equivalent, is not what the council is looking for. So it's only letter of reprimand or formal censure. So are we looking at a letter of reprimand or are we looking as formal censure? Those are the options. Councilmember QB. Well, um, from what Mr. Shields said, uh, you know, I'm concerned about the whole aspect of repetition and what some of us personally may have witnessed or not. Um, but I'm, all, you know, I'm also worried, you know, I, I see what the 
the individuals affected what that person's perceptions were, which seemed, you know, serious to me. Um, we're in charted, uncharted territory here, it's very clear. Can I part provide I, some, yes. mm -hmm. one piece of input here? Uh, based upon my research, the only um, time a formal censure like this was rendered against a public official is with the town of Quartzite. And um, the, <laughs> the, the conduct there was mm -hmm. far, far more egregious than the conduct here. Yep. Letter of recommend. I will okay. a letter yeah. of recommend. Okay, I, I agree with that. You know, I think just to, to sum up as well, I mean, this is this is a letter of reprimand to a council member, but it's also it's also saying that we're in a, that we we respect the law that was passed in 2009, and we know that this applies to us equally to um, as to any employee, and we respect our employees above everything. So, yeah. so is there a consensus? There is letter consensus of to get, letter of reprimand, get it back to us, and with an apology. Deal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. very much for your work. Thank you. All right. Yeah, can we get in. Councilman Granville to come back in? All right, next item on our agenda is our streetcar update. Look at that. I waked up someone in the audience. Uh, hey, Mr. Hey, Harrison. <laughs> How long Welcome. Please come on down. We got some options before us. Yes. <laughs> I will have to leave shortly, so I'll just thought I'd let you know. To the point. And uh, TV's all in. You want to? It's got here. There's four of us for the first part here. What? Mr. Smith. Mr. Welcome. Mr. Mayor. Members of the council. <laughs> Former Mayor Mesa now. Valley Metro CEO. Honorable. 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 Let's get <laughs> Oh, let's yeah, not go too guy. far. Yeah, come on. Let's not stretch it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Um, I'm Eric Iverson, Public Works, Transportation, City of Tempe. I'm actually here um, with uh, Mr. Smith, CEO, um, former mayor of uh, Mesa, and our uh, colleagues at uh, CTE, and I'll let them introduce themselves. My name is Blake Whitson. I'm a technical project manager and engineer at CTE. I'm Dan Rodebaugh. I'm the executive director at CTE. And they were here in the uh, spring of last year, early early uh, spring of last year, to help us out on some of the discussions about the propulsion for streetcar, of which we are um, here to um, provide more information and receive direction from you. Um, in addition to that, we are uh, sharing with you some a new configuration for the trackway alignment on Rio Salado Parkway, and then just some of our other uh, next steps for uh, the project in general. As, as you all are familiar, as we discussed at the December Council meeting and at the February uh, issue review session, these are the four off-wire segments uh, that we have been analyzing, working with CTE, um, our partners with uh, Brookfield, a vehicle manufacturer that's been uh, selected and uh, Valley Metro staff as well as Tempe staff to, to understand all four of these. Um, the first one is this, the Mill Avenue scenario from 9th and uh, Mill stop to the uh, uh, Hayden Ferry Lakeside stop for the wireless section. Um, the second scenario too is the, uh, includes the Mill Avenue location as well as Ash Avenue, um, previously discussed with the council. Scenario three is, is Mill Avenue with the, uh, what we've been calling the gateways or the two main intersections to Mill Avenue at uh, Rio and Mill and at University and Mill. And then scenario four is the option that was looking at basically the entire loop of downtown uh, except for the portion on Rio Salado Parkway from uh, Marina Heights to Hayden Ferry Lakeside. And in this analysis, as you all have uh, become familiarized with this, uh, with this uh, project and um, uh, that it's, it's a partnership with many different um, experts and, of course, with Valley Metro. So we, we have had the entire team of CTE, Valley Metro, um, another consultant's uh, LTK with, uh, through Valley Metro, our design team that's on board with the streetcar project, as well as the vehicle manufacturer, Brookville, working on this analysis that we're providing with you or to you tonight. And the goal of that is really to get some direction uh, from the council, some finality to that, uh, to that uh, wireless portion in the downtown so we can move forward with our, with our uh, streetcar design. And then we also want to just provide you with information about the operational 
um, costs and risks associated with some of the scenarios. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Blake and Dan with CTE to go through the next set of slides. Thanks, Eric. Mayor, Mayor Council, thanks for having us back. Um, when studying the off-wire deployment of the streetcar vehicles, there are two issues that we want to uh, fully understand. And one is the battery state of charge. Uh, state of charge in, is an industry term that correlates to the energy capacity or, or the charge of the batteries on the vehicle. So 0% um, correlates to a dead battery, and 100% correlates to a fully charged battery. So you'll see, I, I will mention some state of charge values and percentage numbers on the following screen. So that will give you a baseline. Zero is a dead battery, 100 is a full battery. Um, the risk with battery state of charge operating off wire is that um, decreasing the battery state of charge can impact the battery life. So uh, large depth of discharges or discharging a lot of energy from that battery regularly can decrease the life of the battery. Um, additionally, the manufacturer of the streetcar vehicle, uh, in order to preserve the life of the battery, they want to limit the window or the range of the battery state of charge that you're able to use. So they limit that range from 38% to 80%. Um, that is a best practice in the industry that is good and conservative and, and indicative that Brookville is, is cautious and um, they want to give you a vehicle that performs uh, for a long life. Uh, what that does mean from an operations perspective is when you do hit that 38% state of charge is you begin to derate the performance of that vehicle. So initially that may, that may mean that the HVAC system doesn't operate at 100% or the vehicle doesn't accelerate quite as, quite as quickly as it usually does and the battery continues to decrease below 38%. Your systems may start shutting down and eventually the vehicle will be stopped. Uh, the second issue associated with operating off wire is raising and lowering the pantograph. So during on-wire sections, of course, the pantograph will be raised. And then when you come to a stop, uh, before starting an off-wire segment, you will have to lower that pantograph and vice versa when you're getting back on, when you're getting back on the wire. This is so we can, using technical terms, it's that thingamajig <laughs> that goes up yeah. and down that connects the car with the wire. Thank you. So, Thank you very much. Well, yeah, I, I knew I, that was for council membership fire. The <laughs> thingamajig is the much more proper term. Yes. Yes. Um, so, and, and raising and lowering the thingamajig a lot uh, regularly, <laughs> there are some, uh, some considerations there for component wear and tear. Uh, there's also, we understand by talking to someone who's currently operating a uh, wireless streetcar in Dallas, that sometimes from an operational perspective, um, there can be some issues there with, with the operator, either for, for forgetting to raise or lower the pantograph, or raising and lowering it at the wrong time, which can impact performance. So, so understanding that, and the number of times that you have to raise and lower the thingamajig is important. <laughs> so, um, so, I mean, I'm fascinated by the whole battery state of charge. When we had the presentation about the hydrogen extension, extended streetcar, um, possibly street, hydrogen extended battery, the whole state of charge issue wasn't really discussed so much because we it showed, your study showed that the hydrogen model never went below, is it 70% or 80%? It was actually the highest performing in terms of battery state of charge of any of the technologies that were brought up. Right, so the, the hydrogen scenario is, is a bit unique because the, you know, with, with only the battery on board, the, you know, you consume battery, ener consume battery energy and the only way to replenish that is to raise the thingamajig and recharge. With the fuel cell, the hydrogen fuel cell scenario, the fuel cell actually acts as a generator on board. So you can, you know, think of it as a diesel generator just that's running constantly, charging the battery while you operate. Um, unfortunately, at the time, we didn't feel that the technology was suitable for the revenue service deployment that Valley Metro had planned and the city had planned, and that um, was still a little early in the research phases for, um, for operating at the level of revenue service that was desired. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, sorry. So we're, we'll run through each of the four scenarios and we'll try to keep it brief, but just uh, so you can understand uh, what are the energy requirements of the different scenarios and what are some of the risks and some, some things that work well and some things that scare us. Um, scenario one, um, the only off-wire section is between uh, 9th, middle of 9th, just south of University Drive up to Hayden Ferry uh, on Rio Salado. Um, that segment, uh, you know, 
approaching ninth, approaching the station at ninth and mill, uh, you would be at full battery capacity, fully charged. You would then lower the pantograph and begin the off-wire segment. Travel down Mill Avenue, um, get on, take a right on the Rio Salado, and get back on wire at Hayden Ferry. Uh, during that, you know, operating that segment off wire, you would drain about 20% of that battery from 80 to 60%. Uh, during worst case scenarios, so imagine a game day, fully loaded vehicle, um, really slow traffic. You know, so during the fully loaded vehicle scenarios, worst case, um, you could operate on that off wire from with that 20% discharge, and you would have um, a, a margin there for 20 minutes or an 18-minute traffic delay uh, without ever occurring a derated performance or you know the system shutdown situation at 38%. Um, well, let's go back. And scenario one is one that Valley Metro we said we can live with this. We, so this is our baseline uh, proposal. Uh, we feel comfortable enough with the, the envelopes and, the, uh, and the, the operating scenario that we can say we can feel comfortable with, uh, with, with this. And, and the reason why we have, thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Smith, the reason why we have the different scenarios is because we spend a lot of time trying to beautify our city and our word here is we're trying to take down wires, but now we're adding wires. And the concern I think the council had, and my colleagues can correct me if I'm wrong, is I'm more concerned about Mill Avenue, which is it. And, and ultimately, if we could have a completely wireless, that'd be great, but we're not there yet. But I hope we keep in mind that <clears throat> whatever we decide on, that we do it with the intent that maybe the, as technology progresses, that we'll be able to be completely off wire and we'll build whatever we're doing, we're looking towards that direction. And that really, the intersections of Rio Salado and Mill, that is the gateway entryway. And, and I would not want to have wires intersecting there, as well as University and Mill. And then potentially Gamage, as, as, as the former mayor mentioned, because of the iconic structure with Gamage. But with that being said, what we have before us, uh, I'm really concerned about all the wires crisscrossing. When I went down to Tucson with you, we looked at the Tucson streetcar. The first thing that popped in my head was all this, at a, at a major intersection, all the wires crossing each other in a four-way stop. I'm like, wow, that's, that's, that's intense. And Mayor, I did. That's maybe to backtrack a little bit where we started from and why we're here. No, I know. You I remember just, the very first meeting. I, we didn't know. Right. And we were, I, I was unwilling to make a commitment as to anything because we didn't have the CT study. So what we tried to do is say, okay, let's, let's understand that Mill Avenue was, when we first started, was the bottom, bottom line. And can we get there as a starting point? Uh, and so we've done the study with CTE with us. We've decided that, yes, we can do that. Now, subsequent to that in the last council meeting, for example, we brought up the, the different scenarios about all off ash, certainly in the intersections, and a variety of, of, of wishes, a wish list, so to speak, as to how the wires are. So these options are really taking us through what we would consider the two, um, not extremes, but the two, uh, the two edges, uh, defining the, the, the paradigm. <clears throat> Option one is our baseline, which we, we feel comfortable with this. And then we go, you'll go through in options two and three, which offers uh, different scenarios that, that accomplish what you're talking about. And then option four would be the, uh, the mother load, the wish list was what if we could go completely off wire on both Mill and Ash? And we've done that analysis for, for, for those and everything in between. Fantastic. Councilman Granma, then Councilman Kubi. Just a quick question. One of the things I didn't see in this uh, is, and I, and I don't know anything about this technology, certainly not as much as you guys do or Councilman Kubi does. Uh, but I know like with a typical battery, over time the battery doesn't charge the same way or it decharges less. So when I saw these numbers, my first thought was, okay, that's day one. Uh, how do these batteries degrade at year, six months or at a year? I mean, I assume these numbers don't hold up a year or two hours. And that's one of the considerations that we'll get into in the other options because, uh, because as you go through cycles and as right. you charge and recharge and charge and recharge, Yes, the, the battery does degrade over time. Like your iPhone. Uh, like your iPhone. <laughs> no, I'm just you know, a, 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 a battery's a battery. And with current technology, what we've tried to do is we've tried to anticipate uh, perfect scenarios, but also what happens if, if, uh, if, if we utilize it many times. One thing we don't know, and we won't know until we actually get out there and use, is does that mean that the life cycle of that battery is 36 months, 60 months, however many it is? We'll find that out as we go, go along, but understanding that the more times you cycle and you drain and recharge and the level of that, you're going to determine the, uh, the life cycle of that battery. And, and, 
and, and typically during negotiations or during the procurement process, you will negotiate a battery warranty. And typically in the industry, that warranty looks something like, you know, we, you know, if within a two-year period or within a four-year period or within a six-year period, whatever is negotiated, it, when that battery holds 80% of the energy that it started with on day one, you know, if it, if it falls, if the battery health, this is the term, if the battery health falls below 80% within a time frame, then, you know, it is below the warranty level, so we will repair or replace the battery in order to meet the 80% health requirement. Now, the, the numbers we see before us assume that the battery is already degraded to 80% health. Oh, okay. So it's kind of the worst, it's kind of the end of life scenario. The battery isn't brand new. This isn't the day one operation. This isn't the day one estimate. This is, we've been operating the vehicle regularly over time. The battery health has degraded. It's near the warranty level. Okay. Councilman QB and then Councilman Shapiro. And then Councilman so, Navarro. A few months back, we reconfigured Rio Salado to um, move the streetcar from the center lane to, uh, to one lane. And so, given this new information about the battery state of charge, couldn't we consider reconfiguring Mill so that the streetcar is on the parking lane and will reduce the chance for an 18 minute delay? Well, the streetcar will go faster on Mill. A lot of us have concerns about stoppages on Mill just because we see stoppages on Mill right now. Um, it might reduce the chance of a delay. Streetcar goes faster. I know that might be, you know, that's going to be design work, but we've already, you know, adjusted it for Rio Salado. Does it make sense to consider that as a, a possibility for a mill? There's, there's two thoughts. I think we talked about this maybe at the December meeting. Um, the uh, the battery state of charge information. Correct. We didn't. Um, we did. Uh, we had the exploration probably a year and a half ago. We worked with the downtown community and and uh, mm -hmm. did the door-to-door -door canvassing to understand what people wanted in the way of where the track would be, whether it was in that parking lane or whether it was in the, the um, through lane. And we did, I think it was about 60, 40, 65, 35 uh, support for the, for the through lane. I'd have to look at the numbers, but I know we did do that and the majority support was for the, the traffic lane. And part of the reasons for that was that people wanted to see um, the possibility of future expansion of the pedestrian area, expansion of restaurant outdoor space in Mill Avenue and keep that flexibility of what's happening in the parking lane today. With full disclosure, though, I yeah. got to tell you, if there was an option presented to the business owners in the DTA, whether it's completely wireless and you have an option to do that, I think it would be completely different because this is how the question was asked. I asked this very same question. I wasn't on the, obviously, I wasn't on the prevailing side of that issue. But to, to Eric's point, he's right. But he did ask it. It was a 60-40 split. But if you re ask the same question again regarding different scenarios and options based on completely wireless on mill, that wasn't even an option when this was done. There, so if you did that, that could have a whole completely different perspective with the business owners as you move forward. Just yeah, that's, that's a valid point. And the, the other issue that we, that we talked about when we went through that process and discussing it with the community was that um, it doesn't necessarily, when you get to the traffic signals, you still would have to have, uh, so when, if you're in that, if you try to make it a dedicated lane, you'd have to change the cycle of the traffic signals. And we anticipated, like if you're on mill in that parking lane, all those signals where, where today, if you're in the, uh, the through lane and the vehicle lane, the streetcar kind of operates like a car, and you can have right turns, you can have pedestrian movement through those intersections. If you have it in that dedicated lane, you would have to create a separate cycle in all of those traffic signals, five of them or so, roughly, and that and that would anticipate we would anticipate that would increase um, the travel time as well as the delay for the whole for each in intersection because you'd be adding another layer to that cycle. Does that make sense? I'm sorry, can I just add one more? To just finish right, I'm in charge so, now, so. I'm so kidding. it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go Alexander Hay. <laughs> go ahead. Well, I just want to add that also 18 months ago, we were in a less traffic situation. We've seen a real increase in traffic on mill, and there's increased development. And so we're kind of, you know, this process has been ongoing for a long time, as you well know. And uh, I, I don't know, I just think that there's should be some consideration for that considering that we see the battery state of charge is now an issue that there's less chance of that happening and more likelihood of unimpeded traffic on a, um, a dedicated lane that's on a parking lane. Did you have something you want to say? I think someone's first and then me. No? Okay. okay. No. Then me. Yeah, um, so you, you talk about battery life, 80%, worst case. Sure. Um, when do the batteries get replaced at 50%? Do we know this? Um, it's, Again, typically that's negotiated through a warranty. So <clears throat> you could specify 80% or, or when, uh, 
from an operational standpoint, when we get to the point where we can't consistently, right. uh, uh, consistently uh, run an operation or a circuit without it coming close to what we would call the danger zone, at that point in time, we would replace the battery. Whatever that percentage is. So I, I, I'm just being a safety guy. We, 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 the battery, the battery usage in the charger is is monitored consistently. Right. Uh, you know, we 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 will re record and track. Uh, the charges, the drainage, those kind of things, that is monitored. And so we just look and, look and see. If, if, if we, the ability to keep a charge and enable us to make the circuit without constantly going in is two years, we have to change in two years. If it's four years, we'll, do, we'll take it as, as far as it can go. But that's, there's really uh, no data or anything that shows what that will be because we are really in uncharted territory. We will be, the, I believe, the second uh, system in the country uh, Detroit is ready to open up in May, and it has a similar type of thing with multiple sections. But other than that, there's there's been no system that runs in the, this environment with battery uh, uh, propulsion. Yeah. So we're in uncharted territory. Uh, Go ahead. No, and, 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 and that was to my point, and, and I was hoping that there was some backing up data, and I was like thinking of uh, Nice, and obviously they've been running that system for a few years. Obviously the climate, climate is not the same, um, but it might give us a ballpark of, what they've been experiencing with their battery replacement uh, and when they um, uh, take them out and, and replace them. And then the other question is obviously the cost of the batteries to replace is 250000 or up to 350000 per replacement. And then, and, I, I, and then on top of that, what happens to the disposal of the battery or what happens to the battery itself? Do we know that by chance? And, I, and I, if you guys came here, I, I, this. No, well, well, two things. Number one, it is right now at today's prices, it is two hundred fifty thousand uh, per battery. So that would be for the six vehicles. Uh, you, you know, you're looking at a million and a half dollars. Uh, the life of the battery, we can't determine, but we're estimating three to five years. Uh, we, three on the low end, five on on the higher end. So, and though that would be cost that will be borne by ten p. That's considered an operating cost. Right. So, you know, do all batteries uh, play out at the same time? You know, we'll see. Uh, we'll have six cars. Four will be in constant uh, uh, constant uh, use. The other two uh, will be in periodic use. So you know, we'll, we'll see how that plays out in operations. But yeah, that, that's that's an amount that you'll have to look forward to uh, in covering on a three to five year cycle is what we estimate. Any other questions at the moment? Want to continue with the yeah. presentation? We're on to scenario two then. Yeah, we can make it to two. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. Two includes the off route segment on mill, uh, just like the other scenarios. It also adds an off route segment between, um, well, you know, along at station three along Rio near Ash down to station six uh, near the Ash and University Drive intersection. <clears throat> uh, this was a scenario that was examined previously uh, about a year ago in the earlier study. Um, similarly to scenario one, the, the largest area of concern is that is that mill segment. Uh, with this scenario, um, the Mill Avenue presents a greater risk than the Ash Avenue, so the Ash Avenue is fine here. Uh, you do have to raise and lower the pantograph twice as often as you do in scenario one because you have that on and off segment along Ash. Scenario three. Just by, just by viewing the image, you can tell scenario three is a little more complicated. Uh, we have this is the scenario that takes into account the desire to keep wires off, off the intersection. Correct. Okay. Correct. So this, uh, just like the other scenarios, Mill Avenue is free of wires throughout the entire, entire segment. Uh, the off-wire on the southbound segment, the off-wire begins at Hayden Ferry, and it continues um, across Mill Avenue onto Ash. Uh, near the intersection of the ash and the light rail track. Um, at that station, at station four, you would raise the pantograph and connect back to the, back on, back on wire. You would travel on wire down near the ash university intersection where you would go off wire for a short segment on university drive through the intersection at mill, which would be off wire. And then you would get back on wire near ninth and mill and continue southbound down to Apache. This segment has similar, from a battery state of charge perspective, similar risk to uh, the other scenarios, but there is an increased wear and tear on 
the pantograph components because now we are raising and lowering it six times uh, every time you complete the loop, which is you know, three times more than scenario one and, twi and you know, a couple more times more than scenario two. And just to explain a little bit what the risk is with the pantograph. First of all, these pantographs on our existing light rail, they might get lowered once a week, uh, if that. They're, they're not designed to go up and down. And obviously, any mechanical unit has a stated life of cycles. Uh, the manufacturer will rate it. Uh, and, and, and to give you an idea, at seven and a half years, we started re, uh, uh, not rehabbing, but replacing, overhauling yeah. and replacing the motors on our pantographs that go down once and twice. There's, there's stress on them as they move because you know, they're on a spring. So we've started to re rehab and, and, and overhaul the assembly after seven, seven and a half years. Obviously, if you're raising and lowering it six times, that will, the motor will wear out much more quickly, and you'll have to spend more on uh, maintenance on that pantograph. Uh, the other thing, uh, and that's, that's one cost that will be more. Uh, we don't know exactly how that will work, once again, because we're, we're in uncharted territory. The other thing is the uh, operator error. And that is that uh, lowering the pantograph, uh, or failure to raise the pantograph, creates a, a, a risk that uh, you know, you run out of battery life. That's probably pretty minimal because <laughs> there'll be warning signs and everything. And before you know it, the, mining, the operator will go, dang it, I forgot it. And they'll hopefully raise it before they can go. That's not the big one. The big one is the failure to lower the pantograph. If you're on an off-wire situation, you fail to lower the pantograph, the wires are here, the thingamajig is there, all of a sudden you run into a structure and there will be damage. There will be damage to the wire. There will be damage to the pantograph. And as is experienced in Dallas, there could be damage to the car itself. Because if you hit at the wrong angle or with enough, with enough force, it could actually bend or tear the, the mooring that's on the top of the car away. Those are risks that uh, we manage through training. Uh, but obviously, the more times you have to go through that operation, the greater the operational risk. Once again, Tempe is in charge of operations. so. Uh, you, re you have two risks. Number one, that the cost uh, to repair will be higher, and, and you will bear that. But also, if you rip the rip a pantograph off of a off of a, a top of a car, then that car is out of service for a while, and so you're, you're, you have a service risk. So I just want you to know that if you make a decision, Valley Metro can go with it, but we, we you need to understand what the operational costs and risk would be. I think uh, Council Member Spiro has a question, and just um, for the information, I know the mayor is on the phone. Mayor, you you are there, right? Probably on mute. Right, go ahead. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Mr. Smith, I have got to believe that uh, technology is at a point such that we could automate the up and down <laughs> movement of that to an extent where, or, or at least have a mixed automation where there's a light that's flashing that says, you're about to hit the wires, lower the darn thing. Like, I got to believe technology is at a point where we, we could solve that problem and, and really minimize the potential for that kind of an error, can't we? There is, there is a system out there, council member, and I would say it can mitigate the problem. I don't believe anyone is willing to say it will minimize the problem. There is an, there is an automated system right. that consists of sensors and other things in the car that also has a, has a cost, a minimum, of, as best we can tell, uh, between about $50,000 a car and uh, half a million dollars a car for the entire installation and everything uh, that would go in and would automate that so you hit a sensor just like on a, a, a train signal that would go up or go down in that. You could do that. It's not foolproof. Uh, it's been tried, but is not, uh, does not have enough experience or data to say that it's foolproof, but it certainly, uh, it certainly uh, uh, could, be, could be tried and could be installed. Once again, that's a Tempe call that's not in the, in the bid right now or the, the costing of the car as we know it. Uh, you, know, you just weigh the risks. Uh, how many pantographs can we damage before we reach that cost? And, and so, you know, it's, it's weighing the, the balancing the risk and the, and the cost. There's a cost to either one. Uh, and uh, I would say that, once again, we are, we can train people and minimize that. We can install the system and, and minimize that as best we can. Either one is acceptable to us right now, as long as we understand the risk that we're, that we're uh, accepting. Any questions about scenario three? Not sure why we're talking about scenario four, but we can. <laughs> Uh, scenario four, like the other scenarios, remains off-wire on mill, <coughs> but uh, it includes an off-wire segment all the way from Hayden Ferry southbound along Ash, all the way down to the ninth and university or ninth and mill stop just south of University. Um, the the Mill Avenue is not the riskiest area of operation for this scenario. What scares us is the operation from Hayden Ferry down to Ninth and Mill. Um, that's over a mile of off-wire. 
And uh, under the worst case loads where the vehicle is fully loaded, operating in, in the Tempe climate with maximum hotel loads and HVAC running on the vehicle, you can run into a situation where only a 10 minute delay along ash uh, could cause you to go into the derated performance zone and begin uh, shutting down some of the accessory systems and eventually stopping the vehicle. Uh, that's uh, based on kind of the, the, the operations that, that you want to run here. Now, we don't recommend this scenario for you. <laughs> well, now, now that we've looked at the different scenarios, I mean, I'll, I'll just say in scenario three, I, 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 you know, it really does kind of contemplate a lot of the input that we've given you and feedback we've given you. I, you know, I'm just looking at Google Earth along the route on ASH where it would still be on wire. You know, one of the concerns we originally expressed about off wire was the tree canopy on mill. There is no tree canopy anywhere along that portion of the ash route uh, that would be on wire as compared to scenario four. So I have less concern there. I also think, um, as the mayor talked about, in terms of technological advances and battery technology, et cetera, that would be an easy segment to remove sort of early on uh, in that technological evolution if we got to a point where it was like, okay, our battery technology is sufficient now. We could easily just pull out that, that small section there on ash and reduce the up and down motion by two, right, by a third. Well, so, well let's put this. Yes, you could do that, but I don't yeah. want to, there's one adjective, I don't know, it's an adjective to say easily. easily. Yes. <laughs> Whatever it is, a grammar. Uh, I've got some wire cutters. Yeah, nothing, <laughs> nothing's easy because this is an integrated system. Remember? Just turn it off. Yeah. I'll use the one, of the one of the challenges that we have and why we need the, the decision now is that, as you can see on option, on scenario three, you have three basically electrical islands. This electrical system is not integrated with the light rail system. And you have to figure out a way to charge those three and create, uh, uh, and create operational uh, consistency and redundancy in those. Mm -hmm. So we can accomplish that uh, uh, with that, but it's not easily just say you can snip wire or, or take it down. Yeah. It's a much more complex process because that would, that would create engineering and, and analysis to how that, would, how that would affect the other two sections that have to be wired. It can, anything can be done at a cost and with, a, with certain risks involved. And, uh, and the other, the other the question, policy. council member, that you said, we went into this understanding that as we move forward, uh, there are two things, well, three things that we are pretty sure of. Number one, batteries will get cheaper, they'll get smaller, and they'll become more efficient. So we, we came into this understanding that uh, the discussion that we're having five, ten years from now, we'll probably be talking about a battery technology that is much advanced as what it is today. We don't know where that will go, but we, we assume that it will be better. Before These we, cars are set up so that they can easily be, uh, easily adapt to that. Before we start kind of vetting through the scenarios, I know there's one slide that we didn't quite cover in regards to the additional cost for the off-wire, <coughs> which was the cost for the batteries, like Councilmember Navarro was discussing. In regards to those maintenance costs, can we go through that really quickly? Uh, did you want to well, uh, well, we can talk about that. Those are what this slide does is it basically uh, puts some dollar amounts into the kind of risks and, uh, that we've been talking about uh, and uh, reiterates the fact that, uh, as you can see, the cost there, that these will be determined, be considered uh, operational uh, uh, costs uh, and therefore will be the, would be the responsibility of, of the city of Tempe uh, under that. So. Thank you, Council Member Yeah, Madam Vice Mayor and Mr. Smith, to your, to your point, I, I, I totally hear you. I mean, my, my point is, at the point where we have the engineering technology and the battery technology that it's sufficient such that we, we don't need that section on ash anymore, I guess my point is that it's an easy, it's an easy takeout compared to when you have the bi-directional wires down on, uh, you know, right. Mill or Apache, for example, which are going to have a lot more infrastructure right. by comparison. Now, that said, I'm about to sort of contradict myself in saying, to uh, former Mayor Giuliano's point, I really, if, if we do go the route of scenario three, I would like us to contemplate before we jump onto that, um, the, dif the eventual difficulty and possibility of taking it all the way around to that stop pass gamage and going off wire. And so maybe that's no difference from scenario three. But what, what I'm asking is, if like you talked about power stations and things like that, if, if we're going to locate a power station along that route, I wouldn't want it to be on mill <coughs> on the southern portion. Right. Because if we put it on mill and we end up removing, like former Mayor Giuliano was talking about, removing around the gamage, now your power station's in the wrong place. 
So I just, I, I would like to contemplate that eventually we would like to have all of Mill Clear wires and plan for that if, if possible. We have a place in front of a certain house on the Gamage Turn on Mill <laughs> good, yeah. that we've been contemplating because we know that person would love to have that good. view out of We can, get you, we can get you an easement, don't worry. I, I think yeah. so. Uh, that's that's a good. a really big plug in his backyard. <laughs> <laughs> that's no, we, we, uh, the idea is that we will design a system that is as flexible as, as possible. Uh, and uh, I, we can't foretell this, uh, foresee the future, but we have an idea of where we're headed. And so we'll try to do the best we can. One other thing, uh, and one other thing to, to, to note, too, and I'm not advocating one way or another because we are agnostic once we get past scenario one, uh, is that the infrastructure for streetcar wires is, is much less than it is for light rail. Uh, the wires aren't as big, the, the, the type of thing. So uh, when, when you get in there, uh, you know, I know that in our mind our vision is that it's the light rail type of thing. Those are much more significant. They're double wired, they're gigantic wires, and it's not quite as much because you're not pulling as much electricity. You have a single car running on that as opposed to the big double cars or, or even three uh, uh, three cars that the light rail is in. So as you think of this, remember, it, it is going to be a different visual uh, uh, with the wires, and you won't see that until it's actually built, but it, it is different than what you see on the light rail. Council Member Kuby, and then Council Member Navarro, sorry. So um, my interest originally in looking at wireless on, on Ash and Mill was to create sort of a cohesive look downtown, a cohesive aesthetic. and. Um, but I agree with Council Member Shapira that just to add the little doohickeys, um, to add the little spur, I mean, I realize some of it has to be west on Rio Salado, but this additional part in Ash doesn't really add much, and it doesn't create cohesiveness. In fact, it takes away from the cohesiveness. And then I was really struck by um, former Mayor Neil Giuliani's um, uh, comments. And just, I mean, when you think about, uh, when we think about Gamage, it is incredibly iconic. And if we could somehow, can we find a way to see how far we can go while keeping the battery at its charge, while reducing risk, and see how far we can go to keep it towards the gamage side and keep it as far below gamage as we can. I mean, I don't know if that sets up a whole new study. Um, but, I mean, can we? One point of concern from, a, from the technology perspective is uh, the batteries will, uh, it is better for the batteries to have uh, continuous stretches of off wire than to continuously cycle off wire on wire off wire on wire because you know cycling the battery from fully charged you know, to draining to fully charged um, you, you want to minimize the number of times you do that so as as you consider the different options that include multiple on wire off wire segments or you content are you contemplating or you contemplate adding or removing segments um, you know that's important to keep in mind that long or continuous segments of off wire are better than multiple breaks. And, and to, if you looked at that scenario three um, and added that the two stops on the gamage curve, you'd be looking at um, increasing that thingamajigger movement, the pantograph movement, by two more. So you'd go up to, I think we're at six for the scenario three, you'd go up to eight. I don't, I'm trying to understand. And then you we would have, would it? you're, so you're, how, you're talking how about- How many pantographs would we have if we went to? Off and on. Right, no, I, I understand that, but you're, you're, you're talking about if you're looking at scenario three or four, if you just move the green further down, how, oh, how is I, that? I think what Eric was thinking of oh. is that you create another gap between ninth and college. Oh, uh, just oh, on the just, on the ga just based upon the data that you're seeing with I, scenario. I got, you. I got you. Or not ninth, but eleventh in right. college. Right. 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 Correct. Councilmember Navarro, you had something you wanted to say? Yeah, and, and, and you kind of answered it, and and we'd have to get back with the study and what that damage curve looks like and what makes appropriate sense if it is doable or, or how doable it is without going off the life of the battery. And then I think another portion of the question was somewhat answered. Um, obviously, the power uh, to run the uh, car is like what, 220, 221? Uh, 220. <laughs> yeah. 700, 750 volts. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, what, <laughs> so what I was uh, with that, though. Good I mean, Michael Keaton quote, though, by the way. <laughs> I got it. I've seen mm -hmm. that movie. So, uh, <laughs> but if we, if we have to, if we have these stops where they're, where the wiring's coming off and on, obviously we have to have infrastructure to continue, continue the cable um, underground. Am I correct? It's That's not correct. just a, another new station or, I have right. no idea. Well, what we would do, for example, coming in from Hayden Ferry is we'll, we'll, the wire will go down and be buried. And we'll just have to have uh, consultants do, the, do the, uh, uh, the calculations as to energy loss and that kind of thing. And they can balance it out, balance the system. But it will be connected. It will come up in, in various 
stages, at least at least two set sites. We'll, we'll either have a north and a south or a three uh, uh, section. To, and then as part of the engineering as we go forward, they will decide where they need to put those, <coughs> uh, uh, those traction power uh, substations uh, to be able to balance the power out. Gotcha. Any more, go ahead. Yeah, I'm still, still conflicted about, um, you know, knowing that Mill is likely the place where we'd have the most congestion and knowing that we've decided to have the streetcar hug the southern side of Rio Salado, right, um, and hug the street and be its own lane there. I just don't understand why on Mill, which is our most trafficked and <laughs> iconic street, why we wouldn't want to consider having it be a dedicated lane when we know, I, I don't want to just do this from personal, re resolve this from personal experience that I get stuck in the middle of traffic all the time. That shouldn't be the way we resolve things, but have our traffic engineers looked at the increased, or maybe it's not increased, maybe it's my perception, but have our traffic engineers looked at the Mill Avenue traffic situation and deemed what might be best for the streetcar yep. in recent times? Have they done it recently? There's a couple things, and I, I said one of them earlier, and that was that we did look at it when we did this, we did this outreach a couple years ago with the, with the community, and it doesn't, and I don't have the data in front of me, but it, you do have to add a, a, a separate phase to each traffic signal yeah, if you, you have that dedicated that. lane, yeah. um, because you because what's happening today is it's, it would be in the traffic lane. It's sort of operating like a bus. Um, the scenario on Mill Avenue, if you put it in that dedicated lane, the the free flowing right turn movements that people make, um, you know, they pull into that parking lane at the intersections. Right, right. All that would that movement would go away. The pedestrian movement would be a little bit more difficult. You'd have to add a phase to those signals, so it does increase the delay or the time period that each one of those signals okay. um, by doing that. You can say that, that before. Well, by saying then, that, you're saying you're not that concerned about the battery state of charge then, so. Not, I mean, I think, we, I think you would add a little bit of that, a, a, you'd exhaust the battery state of charge a little bit by adding a little bit of extra time to that, to that um, each cycle, each signal on Mill Avenue. Um, but I'm less worried about that. I'm more worried about what the response we got from the community and then, and then the fact that it's not necessarily going to increase our, our travel time by having that a dedicated line at Mill. The other difference is that on Rio Salado, you, you, if you're on the south side, there's very few right turn movements crossing, traversing that. that um, it's a different configuration than Mill Avenue. You don't have many right turn movements crossing that trackway if you're on the south side of Rio Salado. Mm -hmm. But I, I will kind of talk about what the mayor mentioned earlier, though. When we did went out for public input and that feedback, the, the fact that there wasn't going to be wires on mill wasn't even part of the discussion at the time, right? So I don't Correct. know if the feedback would be different now or not mm -hmm. um, based on the new information and the direction that we're heading. So food for thought and see what that looks like. I'm not opposed to maybe at least exploring that option, but, you know, we might be able to solve it just by a quick check in and see what, uh, you know, the, the DTA and the businesses along Mill really, how they feel about that. <clears throat> Councilmember Navarro? Uh, uh, I agree, and thanks to your point. And the one other thing is, Councilmember uh, Shapiro brought this up and, and it kind of made me think about, if there is a time down the road with technology getting better and better and better, does it make sense that portions, well, I'm not thinking, this, I'm thinking out loud, I guess, uh, that we can take out sections of that wire, you know, like Ash for Avenue, but, we still have that have to have that continuous circuit. So, is the infrastructure could be planned in a way to where that, uh, if the bearing, if the wires have to be buried throughout the track and throughout the process, is there ability to have that potentially there so that when we come back or we do that later on down the road? And I'm, I'm thinking about like gamage. If gamage can't get in right now, but it could get in later, we can drop those lines on the ground. Uh, having that cost already done while we're doing the tracks and digging it up, does that help? Uh, Councilman Navarro, yeah, we, we bury conduit, uh, whether we're going to use it or not, just because once we put in concrete, it's not nice to go right. uh, uh, cut it out. Mm -hmm. So regardless of that, we'll design what we know now, but we will put in conduit uh, uh, underneath the concrete so that if at some point in time we needed to run a line or whatever, we could do that. Uh, the conduit would be in place. We, we can include that and will include that uh, in, the, in, in the design. So so with scenario three, is there any value to having um, the, the portion on ash um, and the portion that goes a little bit east? We want to cover the intersection to protect the sight lines of the intersection, but is it, what is the value, whether from sight lines or from design? I'm sorry, what which, what is the value about? of having just the small spur on ash? Uh, you get a recharge of batteries because without that, the batteries then reach critical level and, and okay. you get outside the reason. operational mm -hmm. safety range. Mm -hmm. okay. you, need, you need that stretch to... 
Okay. Yeah, to charge. To recharge. So I think our next steps is, I don't know, Councilman McKinney, do you have anything that you wanted to, questions? No. I think moving forward, what we need to do, first and foremost, obviously, is give you guys some direction in what scenario we'd like to lean to, <coughs> some additional things to, to think about. Um, is there a scenario that we can eliminate? Four. Four. Yeah. Another scenario we can eliminate? One. 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 All right. Ooh, this is good. So we're down to two and three. Is there a preference of, of two or three? Three. 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 Councilmember Grandel? Uh, yeah, no, I, I agree. I think council, I think uh, scenario three is, if we're going to do one, I think scenario three is the one to do because particularly when you look at streetcars, the intersections are where you have to put all these wires over everywhere. So it's, it's, it just looks like a mess. Uh, and you want to include, you want to make that sight line go, you know, right mm -hmm. from when you come off the bridge all the way down the Avenue as far as you can. Um, the one thing I would just add, and, and uh, first off, really great presentation, by the way. Um, the one thing I would just add, though, is that two hundred and fifty to three hundred thousand dollars that was per battery, and there were six batteries in three to five years. So you said one point five million. That would be the low end. That would be the two hundred and fifty thousand. The high end would be two point one million. So when you break that down, the lowest possible additional cost is three hundred thousand dollars a year. The upper end could be five or five hundred fifty thousand dollars. Three to five hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, uh, I would say just for me, I have I have faith in your study, and I have faith that this will work. Um, but I, but for three to five hundred thousand dollars a year with a transit tax money, um, gosh, there's a, there's at least one more place I'd want to put an orbit, and that's about the cost of running an orbit every year. So given the choice between uh, having those lines or not having those lines and having another orbit, or having three to five hundred thousand dollars to do some sort of other transit infrastructure, um, that would be my preference. Um, that said, uh, if if that is entirely off the table, then my preference is option three. Uh, Mayor, do you, do you have a preference? I'm sorry. Didn't yes, I, thank you, Vice Mayor. Yeah, I think, I, as I stated earlier, scenario three is what I was looking at. Um, hoping that the progression of the technology advances by the time we get, you know, fully on board and we can make some changes as we move forward. But I'm good with scenario three. Well, I think, I think you kind of heard from us a little bit, but I want to make sure I'm clear with the council in regards to moving forward with scenario number three and some of the other options or some of the things to consider. doesn't mean that that's the direction what we're going to go, but maybe just some thoughts to consider to see if it's even possible. And I know uh, the mayor mentioned definitely the making sure that we're set for future technology, if there's a way that we can do that. I mean, I think we need to make sure that we're prepared for that. I, I don't disagree in the sense of making sure that we need to understand what that maintenance cost is with number three and that we're really clear on that. I think that would be great. And I also like the idea, like Councilmember Shapira talked about, you know, mitigating operator error, error when it comes to the panographs, if there's a way that that could be automated. I think that was something else. And then also I think Councilmember Kubi mentioned maybe just an exploration of a dedicated lane on mill. And maybe we could at least, very least, just get some feedback. And then maybe the expansion around the curve, if that is possible. Expansion around the curve. Damage. In front of damage. Oh. Yeah, just to see so, if that's even okay. viable at all. I'm sorry. Okay. Councilmember Navarro. And just one other thing, and um, maybe you have an answer, or maybe some of that, but if the, if the, if the um, rail does get stuck, how does it get pushed to where it needs to go? Good question. Yeah. They're calling you. Yeah. <laughs> we, uh, we currently, uh, that's going to be, uh, that's going to have to be designed. Uh, it's going to have to be towed uh, or dragged. Or pushed, <laughs> but we, we've considered uh, making that part of the uh, the city council uh, uh, responsibilities. Big man over uh, here. To do it. <laughs> you can't just take another car out there, uh, and so what we'll have to do is we're going to have to put up a on the thingamajig or the watchamacallit. We're going to have a doo-wopy, like you said, <laughs> some sort of way that we can uh, actually tow that uh, with some other means, like a, a truck or a big type of thing, if you have to tow it in. Councilmember Granville. Uh, one other thing, if we could get that would be helpful is I I have a sort of a user experience of what's the worst case scenario for wait times on Mill Avenue, but, um, but that's just off of my head. So we have the numbers, if it's a 10 minute wait, if it's a 15 minute wait, uh, but I don't know on our worst Friday night or whatever it is, uh, how long those waits could be. They feel like they're an hour. Um, I'm sure they're not an hour, but if you have that information, that would be helpful too. We will, I can tell you yesterday, I drove from college uh, through downtown at uh, four o'clock in the afternoon. Okay, that's a pretty bad time. It took me uh, 15 minutes. Right. 
So, and what was your what was your shutdown time? If it was how much of a delay? 18, 18 minutes. minutes. So That's we're yeah, out. that doesn't bode well. That, that was from college. That was from college. Right. College. Okay. That the, the 18 minutes is from yeah. is from uh, uh, basically university. Yeah. Well, it would be interesting to know if a dedicated lane would change those wait times at all. Yeah. I have no idea. It would. But it would that, be, that, that would definitely that might help. Be helpful. If I could Perhaps. now. You, you've introduced two in the back. They'll you've introduced you. two. We like, to, we like to complicate things. Yeah. Well, the two in, and I'm, and once again, uh, we're here to serve you, but we want you to understand what uh, what that takes. There there is no there is no easy way to do things because we are at 30 percent design. We can analyze the two things you've talked about. Number one, the dedicated lane on mill. Uh, what that will do is that will take time and that will take money, because we now have to stop uh, the design that we have now, which is not contemplate a, uh, uh, a dedicated lane and, and then see what that analysis would do and talk to, to Tempe traffic to figure out what kind of scenario we would have, whether we'd allow right lanes, whether what kind of signaling we'd come to, and also then at some point in time we have to design exactly where the track's going to be. Mm -hmm. So that takes time. As far as the analysis on the, on the gamage curve, once again, that takes time and money because the CTE would have to redo another analysis based on Based on what we would uh, what we would probably look at is maybe off wire between college and eleven. Uh, that would take time and uh, time because we now have a designer and a, con and a contractor on board. Uh, they're either working or they're not working, but we're still paying uh, because they've mobilized. So I just want you to know. I want to be straight with you that it could take a month. Uh, I don't know what CTE's time frame is as far as being able to do that. We 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 possibly could be ready by the May 22nd, uh, the next uh, uh, session that you have here. We will try, but I cannot guarantee that. Uh, it might take, uh, uh, you know, four to six weeks to come up with those kind of analyses. That would, that would be sufficient enough to be able to make a decision from. Uh, these are, this is great work that CTE and, and, and others did, but it took a couple, three months to put this together uh, because it's, you know, some of these calculations are, are somewhat complicated. Uh, am I out of line in, in giving those time frames for what you guys can do? No, that was... An appropriate estimate. Um, I think we could have it prepared by May 22nd, but yeah, it's not a, we wouldn't have it tomorrow. That's for but, sure. But I would say we'll do the best we can. If we cannot meet as far as the, as far as the off, uh, the dedicated lane by May 22nd, we'll let you know. Uh, but each, as now, uh, the, the clock's ticking. And just so you know that uh, we need to make some firm decisions so we can move ahead uh, because we have engineers and, and, and just waiting. We'll say, so, okay. We don't disagree, and I, I would just say this: we certainly do appreciate the work that's gone into it, and 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 100 percent understand, um, you know, the time crunch and where we are too. But I, I think from our perspective, is we want to get it right, and uh, once those tracks are in the ground, they're in the ground. Yeah. And so, I agree to with me, you. if it takes a little bit of time, I mean, if, if the council's okay, I would, I think we should take the time to just explore those at least till we get to the point where you say, well, you know what, let give you some quick feedback. And that's just not going to happen moving forward. Let me tell you why. What some of those concerns? I believe we can get it done, and I've talked to our team and, and Eric and everyone. I think May twenty May twenty second is May the next twenty second. May twenty second next report. I believe we can get you a, a sufficient uh, data on both those different alternatives Great. that we can. Uh, but because we're we're now have set in with a scenario three, we'll work from that template. That's perfect. And we'll see what, we'll see what we've got. Well, and I would say, and I think one of the things that you heard probably last time in regards to not having the wires at the intersection, especially at the Rio Salado Mill intersection, how important that was to keep that clear. I don't know about you know for anybody else, but I wouldn't be willing to give that up um, for any of those other options. I think that's really important. And we'll come back. We won't completely dismiss. Let's say that if, if the grant. The Durango curve. I'm sorry, <laughs> Neil. You live on the Durango curve. <laughs> the gamage curve. Uh, if we get the gamage curve, we'll come up with some scenarios because there we may present you with some other trade-offs. Uh, you know, uh, to say, listen, uh, which is more important, this stretch? If we add a stretch here and we do something else on Ash, can we do that? We'll, we'll try and come back with some different scenarios so that you're not, you're not. It's not just totally a yes or no. It's a once again, we like bringing up two and three different scenarios for I mean, you. That's, I think that's totally like fine. And I think one of the things that we've been fairly consistent on in the past is mill needs to be wireless. Right. That was definitely one of the things. And I thought we had heard from the council the last time that that intersection and the gateway into Tempe was really important. to Mill and Real Salado we will not touch. Fantastic. Okay. I can't guarantee okay university and the other Traffic. things. Okay. Traffic time. Like during a damage, you know, during a performance getting out <laughs> on a Friday night, just a couple of options. Absolutely. Councilman Navarro? I'm sorry, did you? That's okay. oh, Councilman Poo? No, no. Um, yeah, I just was um, thinking about, I'm sorry, I have, I have battery problems here. Can you guys fix that on a 38% charge? Um, Drop wire. Just I had concerns, I know, talking about the, the design element, the timing. 
sort of the elephant in the room, it's literally the elephant in the room, is, is the timing of the federal funding. And is that, oh, is that causing point. any challenges to the, uh, um, is that causing any challenges to the, the design process? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just jump. Because we, we, we figured you would be asking about that. Right now, and I'll give you a quick overview of where we are. Uh, right now, the Tempe streetcar is included, as you know, in the FTA budget. We won't call it the president's budget anymore because it's not the president. The FTA budget. Uh, there's approximately 55 uh, projects at various stages in what's called the Capital Improvement Grant Program, CIG program. Uh, the, the current president's budget uh, proposal eliminated that program for any, any projects that do not have a current signed uh, full funding uh, grant agreement, which we do not have. Therefore, under the president's proposal, we would be out. Uh, most of Congress says that that's not going to play out. So where, where's the scenario? Uh, two years ago, Congress passed the FAST Act, the, uh, uh, which was the Surface Transportation Act, which included funding for capital grants such as this. It included a funding at about $2.3 billion a year. Here's the scenarios. There are appropriations bills going through Congress right now to fund the FAST Act. The House bill, the Senate bill, they have different levels of funding. One is at full FAST amount, the other one is not. The President's budget, which included the Tempe project, was at $2 billion above the FAST cap. I think it's pretty safe to say we're not going to go up to what uh, the President's, the President Obama's budget said, which means that the program is oversubscribed. There are more programs in the, in the FTA budget than there will be funds. Uh, we, all, the, we don't know what, what the FTA will do as far as choosing how to uh, allocate whatever funds are, are, uh, are involved. Now, to further complicate the issue, those are the bills that are in progress. Right now, we are operating under a continuing resolution. The continuing resolution is at 2016 amounts, which is below the amount that the FAST Act had approved. That continuing resolution expires on April 28th. Uh, the Congress can choose to do one of two things. They can either enact one of these appropriation bills, which will set in motion or set the amount that is available for these, for these capital projects, or else they will simply extend the continuing resolution through to uh, the end of the fiscal year of September 30th. If they do that, then FTA will come through and they'll take the money they have available, which is 2016 levels, they will decide how to allocate the projects the money among the projects. In anticipation of this, if you'll recall, last September the FTA asked us to resubmit the Tempe project in case they get to the point where they basically choose projects and we're not one of them, then what we would do is we would go back into the next round for the next fiscal year to be reanalyzed again. Are you confused enough? <laughs> it's, a very, it's a very, very fluid situation. We are progressing as though we will be fully funded. And until anything other than that is pure speculation, well, not pure speculation, it's guessing among one of these four different scenarios. We're proceeding as though we'll be fully funded. If we are not, we will be back here before you, and that may be the point of discussion on May 22nd. Uh, we may be back here to have a discussion as to what option B, C, and D are. <laughs> okay. We won't look okay. forward to that. All right. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Thank good. you All right. so much. Thank you. I'm sure, I'm sure you'll have the answer to this question, but I, I would really like to know how the president's proposal reconciles with his campaign promise to do infrastructure yeah. investment. <laughs> uh, but it's a rhetorical question. Totally well, actually, it's an, it's an actual question. It's good, although it's rhetorical coming from the conservative kind of Republican you are. <laughs> <laughs> Here's basically what, what happened. The, the, Heritage, the Heritage Foundation for many years has made proposals to get the federal government out of the transit business. Uh, there are a couple of heritage uh, people in the uh, Office of Management and Budget, and basically the, the President Trump's budget is cut and paste out of the heritage uh, found, uh, plan to basically uh, turn total funding for transit programs over to uh, uh, cities and states. That's, the, that's it. But once again, as, as uh, Senator McConnell said when asked about the, the Trump, uh, President Trump budget, he said, I've been here 35 years, I've seen 35 presidential budgets, I'll leave it at that. So we, we believe that there will be funding. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of uh, much appetite uh, on either side of the aisle or in either houses to completely eliminate that. At this point in time, we just don't know two things, what that level of funding will be, and then how the FTA will decide how to allocate those funds. Those are the two things we're looking at. Well, we just certainly appreciate the work. So I want to say thank you to CTE and your team. You know, Blake, Dan, thank you for being here, Scott and Eric, for all your continued work, and we look forward to hearing back from you in, in May.
right. we did have other slides. Oh. We don't have to go through those. They're in your packet. I, I don't think there's. I don't think there's right. any. That there's not yeah. any questions on them. We're going to continue. <laughs> well, yeah. well, some of those are. Some of those are for my spring break vacation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's, 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 let's get uh, past those. Feet. Oh well, where are we? I'm taking a hike on the Neil Giuliano yeah. Park. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> so we will, but we will be back. But we will be back on on May 22nd to respond to a couple of the the new uh, considerations, the Mill Avenue as well as the damage curves. Working with that scenario three. Um, and then just want to remind you as well that uh, we do have the public meeting coming up on April 19th. Okay. So you all, it's all That's on your good. calendars. Thank you. Councilmember Navarro. Just so I'm clear, you will go come back on the, because we had a discussion on the corner of Mill and Rio Salado on how that track is going to turn. Mill and Rio Salado. So that's, um, that is what we are configuring right now. That's what we are going through design with right now. We, um, some of the drawings that you see before you, um, are, are looking at that. We understand that there are um, considerations that we need to be careful about with the Hayden Flour Mill development. We've been talking to them. Um, uh, the design team as well as uh, city representatives and their, their attorney. Uh, we want to keep working with them. We think that we can come up with a workable solution. We do know that um, it does, uh, it, it travels right on that corner there. So we, we think we can fit in the bike lane and the pedestrian facilities as well as integrate in with that development. Um, we want, but we do not have that final design. We want to keep working uh, with them. And then same, same thing applies with ASU as we get over into in front of Sundival Stadium, as well as um, hugging around the edge of the uh, preserve, uh, making sure that we design that correctly. This, these are uh, uh, designs that will show up in our 30% um, that are being distributed now, as well as uh, more, more detailed into the 60% coming out this summer. We can, bring, we can bring that back to you, a little bit more information back to you in, in May. Okay. And again, that public meeting, April 19th? April 19th. Okay. Uh, at the Cassano Room Transportation Center. Anything else? We really appreciate it. Thank you guys very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. For seeing you in May. Oh, yeah, we just skipped right through this. All right, next on the agenda, we have the proposed Arts and Cultural Commission and Board Restructuring. And Ralph, I think uh, Ralph Remington is going to be heading this discussion. Bro, what, what? Come on down. You're the next contestant. <laughs> Uh, I look official. Right. Cool. I need more space. Let's see. It's weird. It's like it's <laughs> Hello? Uh, Ralph, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, council members. Uh, I'm Ralph Remington, uh, Deputy Director of Arts and Culture. Uh, I'm joining tonight uh, with uh, Kelly Nelson, who is a uh, former board chair of Tempe Municipal Arts Commission and a current board member. And I'm Kathy Husser. I am the deputy director for community services at the library. And with me is vice chair of the Tempe Museum and Library Advisory Board, Peggy Maroney. So uh, we're here to uh, update the mayor and the council on recommendations for boards and commissions. Uh, council voted to implement uh, Tempe Arts and Culture Plan which created an arts and culture division. Uh, this plan brought changes to the Tempe Municipal Arts Commission that we call TMAC, revising the powers and duties of the commission. Uh, the plan called for the formation of an arts and culture division, which would oversee the Tempe Center for the Arts, a municipal arts program, arts education, arts engagement, and the Tempe History Museum. Since the museum aligns with the cultural mission of the approved plan and currently is under the arts division of community services. With this organizational change, the plan also recommends changes to the citizen advisory boards, which include Tempe Municipal Arts Commission and the Tempe History Museum and the Library Advisory Board. So with support from both boards involved, uh, who have discussed and voted on the proposed changes and the new roles, uh, including uh, Kelly Nelson and the Museum and Library Board Vice Chair Peggy Maroney, the Community Services Department proposes that TMAC be restructured to become the Arts and Culture Commission. So the new board, uh, through attrition, would have nine members instead of 13. This change to a new Arts and Culture Commission would then necessitate the change of the current Tempe History Museum and Library Advisory Board, which would solely then support the Tempe Public Library and consist of seven members. The Library Board would also consider the time frame for appointing officers to coincide with the December 31st term expiration dates. <coughs> 
Based on feedback, the revised ordinances for the Tempe Municipal Arts Commission to become the Arts and Culture Commission and the Tempe History Museum and Library Advisory Board to become the Tempe Library Advisory Board would go to council for first and second hearings and approval in May for implementation July 1st, 2017. That's it, and we're open for questions. All right, Council Member Kubi. So I do have a question. We've spoken um, about this offline, but um, the three most recent commissions have 11 members. Can you explain why you settled on nine versus 11? Well, at the time, uh, TMAC, we uh, had nine members to, or went to nine members to be consistent with, at that time, the library uh, commission, mm -hmm. library board. So it was to be consistent with that board. That's basically the reason. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? No, I thought you guys did a really good job. I mean, first and foremost, thank you for what you do. Really do appreciate it. Thank and you for I what you do. It did. sounds like uh, we're all we're all okay with the two changes, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sure. Very nice. All right. Excellent thank presentation, you. Ron. Thank, thank you so you. much. All right. Take care. Thank you, Kelly, Kathy, and Peggy. Thanks. All right. I'm sure this next one's going to go quick. That was a joke. Fifth Street. <laughs> Fifth Street Streetscape and Traffic Calming Project. Oh, back. Eric, Eric is back. All right. I think I'm supposed to have Braden K with me, but we'll just, more, we'll just talk about him. Anyone want to join? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, nobody's coming down, Eric. It's like All you're right, on your own. Great. Then you're lost for me. <laughs> yeah, we're ready to go. Are we waiting? Or? No, you're gone. No. There's four of you, I guess. Skip through this. Yeah. All right, we'll, we'll uh, move through it quickly then. So, there thank you. Oh, yeah, there he is. There he is. Uh -huh. Nice try. <laughs> We're done. <laughs> you, you can only hope. You can only hope. Sure, get a jacket on so quick. <laughs> Colors all pop. Color. <laughs> <laughs> Look like Sean Spicer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Vice Mayor uh, Arredondo, members of council. Um, Eric Iverson, transportation, and I'm here with uh, Braden Kay, sustainability manager. Um, this this uh, project that we want to um, hopefully give you a um, brief-ish um, update on, since uh, you've had a long meeting already, um, is a streetscape project, not unlike a lot of our street, streetscape projects that we have um, designed and constructed over the years in Tempe that you're all familiar with. The difference with this one is that we've really um, taken this one through a, um, an even more exhaustive public process as well as a partnership with our Transportation Commission, our transportation staff, and the sustainability program at the city. So that's why, that's why Braden's here, and we just want to emphasize that that has been a really important element of the project as we've moved forward. Everyone's familiar with, with Fifth Street. Um, you all are familiar with Fifth Street. This is, these are the limits of the project, though. It goes on the east end from uh, College Avenue to the west end, connecting to our historic neighborhoods, uh, Riverside Sunset on the, on the west side. Um, and then it has, obviously, major destinations along the route, City Hall, Hayden View Preserve, um, Transportation Center, new and old, really important to the community. This is a little bit of the history. This project emerged out of the parking study that you all um, had many meetings on in 2015. Uh, looking at how we could handle or how we could include more on-street parking in our downtown streets. Um, and then that just kind of opened up a larger discussion about what we could do on Fifth Street, this major street in the downtown. Uh, we hired a design team using uh, downtown parking revenue funds, working with the DTA. Uh, we hired that team, Collective is the name of the team, uh, in the summer of 2016 and then embarked upon a public process um, in 2016. Uh, I think some of you came to our public meeting and um, we had a couple other forums where we uh, worked on uh, input for this project. Uh, we are now at the point, taking in all that information we received from the community, we're at the point of, of having developed this preferred concept that we're advancing to you today. We're taking around to different boards and commissions and, and seeking feedback. And we did also have a public meeting on uh, Tuesday night. Tuesday night for the project. So these are some of the teams, not all, um, some of the groups that we have reached out to. We have uh, gone to, I think, six boards and commissions in the fall, and we're going back to them now, sharing this design concept that you're seeing today. So we have already gone to some of those. We are, we are going to others um, coming up. And then, of course, working with all the appropriate city departments, from police department, fire department, transportation, um, trash, recycle collection, um, all those different teams. And then stakeholders along the uh, uh, property owners and stakeholders along the street itself. The scope of the project, um, again, this is similar to a lot of our streetscape projects. Um, these are the types of things that we, we need to get out of a project like this in developing the construction documents. So uh, we want to make sure we're preserving all the transportation 
um, options that are out there today. So bike, pet, and the, the other, of course, utilitarian uh, things like delivery vehicles all need to be accommodated. It's an important street for utilities themselves, so underground utilities. Um, there's a lot of them out there. We want to make sure that we're um, leaving open the, the possibility for upgrades and um, um, renewals of those utilities under the road, so we have to design this appropriately um, with that in mind. And then we, we also know that this is a street that's um, closed down for a lot of events, so we need to make sure that it is um, flexible. It can convert to a street and back to an event um, space with great flexibility. And so we've received a lot of input from DTA, ASU, and police department on, on that. And then finally, as I mentioned earlier, we want this to kind of um, step up a notch in what we're doing with our streets and create something that has an even greater reflection of sustainability and not just you know, environmental sustainability, but like our long-term maintenance costs, those types of things, how the trees perform, all those kinds of things that are important to <clears throat> sustainability. Uh, these are major takeaways, not a lot of surprises here on what we heard from the community. Um, you all hear these things too when you go out um, and, and have conversations with the community. Um, we, ha we have a pretty well-functioning street today. We want to make that even better. We want to make it um, uh, more attractive, um, increase the shade we heard a lot of. Um, it's, a, it's one of the busiest pedestrian streets in the, in the city, maybe in the region probably. Um, Mill Avenue and College Avenue are, are comparative. So we heard a lot about making sure that the pedestrian space was actually even more ample and, uh, and shaded. Um, that was really important. We did hear a lot of feedback from the community about utilizing that center turn lane in some sections where we didn't have a lot of left turn movements, utilizing that center turn lane uh, for other things like parking or, or landscape. Um, right, so can I stop you really quick? Yeah. Because only because we had a, somebody come up and ask in regards to the shade increase. Do you have a percentage of shade hmm. increase, or do we have a standard? Can you just answer that while you're on that subject real quick? We, and and Braden actually knows a lot about this, but there was an urban uh, forest tree canopy study that was done. I think you guys did receive a report on that. We have percentages for every street, every major street, um, and so we can provide that information to the individual that that came up here. Um, Braden or I can send that information, but uh, this street today is at 13% tree canopy coverage. Our streets are actually one of the least shaded in the in the region for obvious uh, or in the city for obvious reasons. So I think the average of our street canopy coverage, tree coverage on streets is 1%. So this is better than than that uh, percentage. We wanted to to look at moving this up to 25%, and that's kind of an objective of that of that study is to push the city to a greater tree I think canopy you coverage. His question, so okay, <laughs> I keep going. Sorry. Oh, you're good. No, thank you. So these are the, taking all that feedback that we heard from the public, these are the goals that we set forward that we've been sharing with the different boards and commissions and that really were, were the synthesis of, of the Transportation and Sustainability Commission's efforts um, to, to guide this project. Um, so again, reinforcing this idea that, that we have to have a flexible street that can be an event space, a social space, as well as you know, most of the time being a street. Um, we wanted to, as, as a result of the parking study, we wanted to look at adding on-street parking here. So as a way to, uh, we know that there's some parking concerns in the downtown. This is a way to achieve uh, um, short-term temporary parking um, with quick access to buildings. So we added, we are showing an additional parking um, on this project as a goal. Um, we wanted to make sure that we balance the cost of the project with the long-term maintenance and util utility needs for the street. Um, and then um, we wanted to connect well to ASU and connect well to, to the downtown and connect well to our, to our adjacent neighborhoods. We also want to protect the, the historic character of the neighborhood to the, uh, to the west. And then finally, I'll just mention, we, we talked about the tree canopy coverage. We wanted to achieve a 25% coverage on the street, but we also wanted to look at, um, in, in complement to that tree canopy coverage, 100% uh, rainfall capture. So working with how we design the street, the, the drainage on the street to actually collect any rainfall that we get and, and, and send that rainfall into our landscape areas. This is the preferred concept. Um, you can't really see it on this screen. You can hopefully see it on your screens. We will do, um, we have blow up sections. What's that? If you speak for yourself, I can yeah. see. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm the oldest one. <laughs> so we, she can't see. She can't see. <laughs> I will walk you through this. Um, <laughs> what, funny boy? <laughs> Sorry, go on. <laughs> the, we the major elements of the preferred concept that we're that we are that we put into the drawings, working with the collective has put into the drawings, um, is is the items that are listed below. So I will go through those as we go through the rest of the presentation. But again, no no big surprises here. Some some um, new things that we're integrating in, um, like the 25 percent uh, tree canopy coverage. That that goal. But we are talking about some uh, removal of the center turn lane in areas where we think it's appropriate and, and the traffic uh, capacity is not diminished. 
Uh, and then we're also proposing a pretty significant change in front of City Hall and then some, some gateway treatments at some of the major intersections. And I'll go through those in the next uh, set of slides. So we're traveling from uh, west to east. Uh, we just want to show you what the current conditions are and then how we're proposing to change it. Uh, this is Farmer and Ash at the connection to Riverside Sunset and, and um, by the railroad tracks there and the uh, uh, SRP power lines. Um, these two major intersections uh, on the street, this is how we propose to change them. Um, and, and some of these are typical for all of the treatments that you see along the street. We're looking at increased, visible, in, increased visibility in the crosswalk, so that's not unlike what we've done on University Drive and Broadway Road. Um, some type of paving material um, or color or, or uh, a visible marker that um, draws out the visibility of that, of that uh, pedestrian experience. A little bit wider sidewalks, additional landscaping, uh, and a median uh, in the center of the road where um, there is none today. This still allows for the turn movements that, that all happen at those two intersections. Uh, you can see that um, uh, we also are recognizing the narrower street further, further west on Farmer Avenue as you get into the neighborhood. Um, and then a little bit of uh, a uh, higher visibility bike lane as well on this. We're talking about utilizing that green bike lane treatment that we've done in other parts of the city. These are some examples of, of what those treatments look like in, in our city today. And, and uh, the image on the left is an overhead lighting element that we are proposing to introduce at the, at the four gateways. Um, this is a sort of an overhead atmosphere lighting. Uh, we call it festooned lighting in the, in the, uh, in the plans. And we are introducing that, at, uh, proposing to introduce that farmer, mill, uh, city hall, and then college. There's some other drawings of that in the future, in the presentation as well. This is the block continuing east. This is the block between uh, Ash and Maple. Uh, this is where we would be proposing to eliminate that center turn lane and introduce the angled parking on the side of the road, uh, utilizing that space, as well as uh, additional landscaping. Um, so you can see how the street, we would, we would uh, bring it down to just those, the two through lanes, one lane eastbound, one lane westbound in this section adding that, that additional parking and landscaping on the sides of the road and a little bit wider sidewalk, so making a better pedestrian experience. And then keeping with those, the higher visibility crosswalks. These are examples of what uh, bike lane with that angled parking could look like. Uh, and also landscaping adjacent to angled parking. Oh, that idea, the backup parking. These are, you know, we. We would have to go through, we're going to go through this in the construction documents about what this exactly looks like, but um, something similar to this is what we're, what we're thinking. Mill Avenue, uh, this intersection we are, uh, this is today's conditions, and we are uh, looking at a couple elements here to, uh, for your consideration. One is the overhead uh, date palms with that, that overhead uh, experience lighting. Uh, you can see it in the drawing there. We're also looking at um, uh, the there's additional asphalt at all four corners of, of this street, and I'll show a, a visual next. Um, we're proposing to, to absorb that additional asphalt into the pedestrian areas. It still allows for all of the traffic movements that are out there today, with the exception of uh, we have a proposed elimination of a dedicated right turn lane going from eastbound this street onto southbound Mill. It's the lowest, lowest uh, movement uh, uh, in that whole intersection, whether you're on Mill or Fifth. Um, but we would be proposing to, to remove that, that dedicated right turn lane. Uh, that's on the post office corner, basically. And that gives us a little bit more pedestrian space um, on that corner, as well as the corner north, uh, on the north side, uh, northwest corner. So that is one change there. We'd want to test that. And I was going to we have a slide later in the presentation that talks about wanting to test some of these, some of these changes that are somewhat significant. So we'd want to test that before we make the, make the final determination. The other elements here is we'd be, get, again, looking at uh, a little bit a possible different uh, material or design into the intersection itself, along with the um, higher visibility crosswalks. Continuing eastward, any questions? Good. This is a this is a um, actually a visual of the traffic conditions on on Mill as we would propose it. Again, um, no changes to the intersection movements that are allowed today, but we would be uh, considering the removal, as shown in the, in the drawing here, removal of that dedicated right turn lane um, going from eastbound mill to south, or eastbound fifth to southbound mill. Bike lane. <laughs> well, there is a possibility it could be a shared, 
the configuration um, today is uh, uh, on the other side of the street is that, that there is no dedicated right turn lane, but it's kind of a shared bike lane, right turn lane. And that's, that's a configuration we've done in other parts of the city. <clears throat> this is some uh, visuals of, of different type of paving materials in the sidewalk that we would want to consider, bring back to you. Um, some outdoor dining that we, we see along the street that we want to try and encourage with this project. And then I talked earlier about that, that uh, there's extra asphalt at that intersection. So the image on the, on the left of the screen here shows where you have the curb. Um, this is adjacent to the Starbucks patio. So you have the, the patio and then you have a, uh, the curb and gutter. And then you have, there's about three feet there of, of uh, extra street that we would propose to absorb into the pedestrian area and just have the, the sidewalk go up to uh, and the curb go up to the bike lane as is typical for, for a street. So that gives us a little bit better um, pedestrian experience on the street. You said you were talking about using different type of uh, uh, brick or changing the brick out? We, we want to have a, we, as we, uh, assuming we get support for this, this concept, we want to come back and talk about materials like tree selection and, and share that with you. <clears throat> we, we would like to explore, as was done with the Transportation Center, as was done with uh, portions of College Avenue, um, introducing some new paving material. We want to make sure that we keep <clears throat> enough of the brick that is the character of the downtown in, integrated into this, but it could be at intervals <clears throat> with other paving materials that, that could be a part of that, like permeable pavers, et cetera. And, and then to that point, you were talking about rain capture, which I love, um, you know, but what about any incorporation of um, through the gutter or, or capturing water through that porous material or using a different type of uh, um, street, you know, right, right to the edge of the gutter so when, you, when it does rain, you still have that capturing of that material through, that, through the trees, creating sure. bigger trees. Yeah, we, th that's a great point, and we are definitely talking about this with, with, um, uh, uh, through our sustainability discussions. Um, you, can, you can use permeable pavers that the water just goes through and goes into the landscape areas. We want to make sure that we're matching where those permeable pavers are and that it actually is going into those, those areas. You can also just channelize the water, so making sure that how we, how we design the drainage on the street, that we're sending it through those imp impervious surfaces into the landscape areas. And then uh, the city hall block. This is where we have the most significant change uh, proposed. Uh, we, this is current conditions today, everyone's familiar with that. And, and we are proposing here to, uh, uh, similar to the block between Ash and Maple, to remove that center turn lane. Uh, there's limited left turn movements on the street. Um, so we would allocate that, that center turn lane space to the edges of the road with landscaping, uh, additional uh, sidewalk um, space, and um, uh, I said landscaping. We would also be looking at reconfiguring the crosswalk uh, that is currently really focused on Myrtle. We keep a crosswalk there, um, but we want to look at really centralizing the crosswalk experience to kind of welcome people into City Hall and onto the, uh, into the council chambers, into City Hall, and onto the, the uh, deck of City Hall. We really try to activate. Uh, one of the things we heard uh, through this process is that people really wanted to try and be connected to Sixth Street Park better, uh, connected to the deck of, of City Hall for future events. Um, so really try to, to uh, uh, celebrate the fact that City Hall's there and really recognize in, the, in that block um, the, the importance of, of City Hall and that experience. So we are meeting with uh, police department. We're meeting with uh, Mission Palms to talk about this concept. We'd be proposing uh, that block to be elevated to um, similar to College Avenue between 6th and 7th uh, uh, next to ASU campus. Um, we'd be looking at elevating the street up to the pedestrian level. So. Uh, it's sort of an extended speed table, if you will, um, and then doing different material other than asphalt in that, uh, in that one section where the street is raised up to the pedestrian level. Any questions on that? We also are proposing uh, on this the overhead light experience that we talked about at Farmer and Mill uh, with the date palms and then um, possibly reconfiguring with your support, uh, reconfiguring the parking lot to the west of uh, City Hall uh, to have just one driveway and have it internally circulate so you can still make all the movements, but you wouldn't be doing it. Um, you know, those driveways today are kind of operated as one in, one out. Um, you do that internal circulation in the uh, parking lot. We would maintain the council parking spaces, maintain the, um, the ATM access there that, that is there today, and then also uh, maintain all the delivery service that, that happens in there. Yeah. Yeah. Councilmember Gooby? So I'm really intrigued by the, the patio idea, um, and because I 
that lot is so so ugly. It's pretty ugly. Um, and I was at a um, an ASU uh, forum. Where a lot of students had some ideas. One was intriguing to have a sort of an edible landscaping walking tour in Fifth. And you mentioned that that's really prohibitively probably expensive because of all the maintenance um, of that, maybe not very realistic, but be awesome if there was a, an area, maybe not there, maybe a different place in the street where we could have that concept or there could be some kind of iconic, iconicness about the space, whether it's the kind of tree that's chosen or, you know, pomegranates or some kind of edible landscape and that kind of defines that area on its own. Yeah. But that's just my idea. I don't know how you guys feel about it. And that was mentioned at the, at the, <laughs> That was mentioned at the public meeting. It's, it, I think if there is a location on the street where this would be appropriate, or a park space where, the, where that kind of a concept of an edible landscape or a educational mm -hmm. um, uh, location would be, it would be in this in this area around City Hall, I think, and that and that uh, reconfiguration of the parking lot would really kind of allow for that experience to happen. I think it's it's also it's something like a it could be an ASU project, it could be something that could be a great partnership opportunity. It's not a big. Um, space, but it's something that could be really... For the EPICS, the engineering projects mm -hmm. and community service, yeah. And yeah. there could be an opportunity, I know there's plans for all downtown to have pop-up parks and different public art performances, and that could be a space. I know it's going to be small, but it could be a space that would incorporate that as well. Yeah. It could be, be a good entryway into 6th Street, too, I think, like, mm -hmm. to use 6th Street Park somehow to connect those. It would be really yeah. important to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Give you a few more slides. No, that's good. Yeah, we're yeah. almost done. No, we're good. Just more images of the types of things that we're looking at. So you see College Avenue here, the overhead lighting. Uh, we also think that this this particular block is an opportunity to do some of the things that we've done around the community, where you could use the pavement to kind of tell a story. The Historic Preservation Commission, the Mayor's Commission on Disability Concern, the Arts Commission, they were all interested in utilizing the pedestrian areas as ways to maybe tell the story of Tempe in and around City Hall. And then College Avenue, this one. Uh, is the east end of the project connection to ASU um, current conditions, and then here's what we would be proposing: um, a, a little bit simpler, um, because there's been there's been a lot of improvements down in that area because of uh, the new Grady Gambridge's building as well as the transportation center. We would be proposing a uh, <coughs> the overhead lighting at this particular location as well as the uh, median treatment that we did down at Farmer. Um, the median that we're showing here does still allow for all the LRT movements as well as the um, Turn, turn, left turns, all the, all the turn movements, that's been engineered in there, so we can do it. Um, we think it's, this meeting kind of sets a tone, is also um, really uh, kind of softens the edge going, going down the street and connects you to the butte a little bit better in that trailhead that's on the north side of the street. A little bit higher detail on that particular intersection. Uh, these are some images of, uh, this is some mosaic work that was done in downtown Glendale telling the story of Glendale. Uh, so just another idea of, of public art opportunities or storytelling opportunities that could happen in the, uh, in the <clears throat> project, and then just the view of College Avenue. These are our next steps. We did have a public meeting on Tuesday night. We had uh, about 25 folks that, that came to that meeting. Uh, we had 11 comments all in support of the project. Uh, and we, we actually will, um, we can send you those comments uh, when, the, when the public comment period closes on Monday. And then we would like to, as I mentioned earlier, um, advance this into start looking at our construction documents, bring you back details on you know, some of the tree selection, some of the questions that Councilmember QB asked, um, as well as the traffic data after we do the, the simulation that we're proposing um, in the fall. Councilmember Barrow. Yeah, I, I just want to first say thank you for the presentation. What a uh, in-depth, it, it's really looking sharp and good. I remember when we started this conversation a while back when, and we had stick figures and things like that. It's really progressed. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, no, I, and I think he's done a great job with the trees, the landscape, um, <clears> just incorporating that, the lighting, and, 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 and kind of really taking the best practices throughout the country and, and utilizing that. So I've, I've been very supportive. I, I, th I think, and I'll let um, uh, Council Member uh, Keating probably talk on it, but there probably might be some concerns on mill and fifth, just with that traffic flow there, and that could be complicated, so. Council Member Keating? Uh, yeah, I'd like to thank you guys for putting this together. I think it looks awesome. I'm really excited for this. Um, I think it's really gonna transform the downtown of Tempe. It's gonna change how it looks and feels, and it's gonna, ch I mean, it's gonna be fantastic for the city. I do have one concern, and that is, um, you laid out, you know, changes to the streetscape and how they would be essentially traffic neutral today, which is fantastic. But there is a office building going in on the corner of Farmer and Fifth Street, 
and there also is the Opus project, which just broke ground uh, not too long ago, coming in. So I'm worried about people at you know, five o'clock trying to leave that office, and if they want to get out of the downtown area, they can't really go north. They can go south um, on Farmer all the way to University, and then try to make that turn, which would probably be a nightmare at that time of day. Or they're going, or they can go to Mill Avenue and go south, and then not too far or out of the kind of the congested area. And I'm worried about the removal of that right-hand turn lane right there as a, as a traffic easement feature. And I'd definitely like to see some sort of option that keeps that right-hand turn lane there um, to help shuffle people uh, in and out of the downtown kind of area. Fifth and Mill? Yeah, yeah, Fifth and Mill, yes. Yeah, on the east side of the road. That's correct. Yeah, I yeah. totally agree with that, too. Yeah. East side of the road? West side. West side, west side. West side. West side. West side of the road. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. Yes. Um, yeah, that, that was pretty much it. I, I'd say otherwise, I worry about people going through the neighborhoods to try to get to, to university, uh, try to head south. And I think we'll see that happen. That's great feedback, and we would definitely look at the options um, for design of that intersection, especially as it relates to the, and we would study those or simulate those as part of the fall test period. OK, thank you. Uh, yeah, I've got a, first off, of course, great job. Um, the presentation that you did to the public was also really great. A lot of good information there. Um, I do have uh, a couple of bits of feedback, not surprisingly. Uh, the first one is at the Farmer Ash location. If you could bring that slide up. Wow, I'm getting busy. There we go. Um, so if you go one more slide back, looking at the north side of that street where the bus stop is. Uh -huh. So you can see there actually is sort of a, that weird striped zone that looks, I don't know, like a wedge. Yeah. And you turned that into, or maybe it already was, a bus stop if you go forward. But it's a bus stop right in the middle of the bike lane. And instead, you added sidewalk, where you could have just not added sidewalk and make, kept that as a, a pulled out area so you weren't actually blocking uh, a bike lane while people were boarding. And so my suggestion would be just don't add sidewalk and instead make that a pullout so that you're not um, blocking traffic, particularly since I can tell you, I've done the bike counts on those corners, and it's comfortably uh, 35 or 40 people going east-west an hour during the middle parts of that day. And just one bus would mean all those people pull into what is now a very narrow street because of the median, because of the middle part. Um, can I ask you something yeah. on that, though? Can you get maybe, why, if you're getting some information, check the boarding? information on oh, that sure. particular bus just to see how often it does yeah, stop we, and what the boarding number is. We will provide is. you I mean, that boarding. We, yeah, I think that would be really helpful. Um, that's not a full bus, right? That's something else, I think. No, that is a full oh, um, fixed okay. route. It's the Route uh, 62 um, Hardy, Hardy route, um, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly. There's also an orbit, too, that goes down there, right? There is the um, orbit uh, Venus yes. that, goes, that goes there as well, yeah. So, the, so, but it is, my point with saying that it's the, lar the 62 route is, so we are designing it so that the larger bus can make the turn onto Farmer and that it's, it's accommodated with that stop. Um, but we will look at, Councilmember Granville, we will look at the, right. the possibility of separating the bike lane from that, from that transit. I mean, that's a, the bike lane stop is something that happens all, all the time, but sure. given that we are redesigning, we can look at that. I just, yeah, I mean, and if there weren't extra sidewalk there to play with, I would say, well, it is what it is. But if you've got the extra sidewalk there anyway, I'm not sure really what you get by turning that extra space in the sidewalk. I mean, you get a little, you know, you get a little less congestion for sidewalk, but uh, the second one is if you could go to Mill and, uh, uh, you know, Mill and Fifth. Um, I, I, yeah, it's, that's perfect. So I can tell you, um, I am positive that people use the uh, the bike lane for a right hand turn lane when you're heading north south. Um, and so I don't think, given the number of businesses and the number of things you guys are doing, that curbs everywhere are a good idea. Um, but if there was a curb the last 10, 12 feet, like a little, you know, something like that, where the bike lane is just to make it very clear to cars that while they're waiting in traffic uh, and they're frustrated, they don't sort of do like a mirror check and then pull into the bike lane and say, well, I'm a Mini Cooper, I won't hit anybody. Um, and again, I understand that for the other parts where there are ins and outs and you've got street parking, that, that's totally inappropriate. But at least at those major corners, at least at the mill corner, the other ones are less of an issue. You're talking about basically some sort of protected bike lane right at the intersection. But not bollards. Right. Nobody likes bollards. Right. <laughs> but yes, but if it was just like a little curb, uh, and I understand that there are issues with street sweeps, which is why we don't normally do them, yeah. but if it was only a four or a six foot 
like something just small enough to keep people from pulling in there and cutting into the bike lane. Um, I'm sure there's you know some creative way we can still get that sweat. Um, Look at that. I, I do appreciate that. The next one is at uh, uh, Ash to Maple. Is it, oh, you know what? The one uh, doesn't really work here. Can you show the really large picture? The long one. The long one that's unviewable. Oh, okay. So you can't see it in this photo, but on the far left, where we cross the train tracks, there is a uh, a bus stop east of those train tracks, but then there's also a bus stop west of those train tracks. They're within 40 yards of each other, 25 yards of each other, it seems like. Um, and I know from you know the, the discussions that, that we've had routinely with, uh, with the bus people, they really don't like to put a bus pull out before an intersection because people pull into the light and they stop and the bus is stuck in the pull out. And then when the people go, the traffic is now whizzing. And so they can never get pulled out again because uh, they don't have a light to help them. And so we've already got that problem solved here because there's a spot on the north side of the northwest corner, 30 yards away, uh, where you do get the light that would stop the traffic and then the bus can pull out and go. So why we need one on the northeast corner, I, I, I really don't understand. Um, maybe there's a reason, but I just, is there another picture that shows it better? Okay, okay. thank you, I just, I must have missed it. You're talking here. You can kind of see, you're talking There's the two. train track there. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Yeah. So you can see it so, on the far right edge. It's almost off the picture. Right. And I just don't know why you would put it there, considering that you're, I feel like you're just never going to get out of there. <laughs> uh, and you could just as well go a little bit to the left. I, you know what? I don't know the answer to why we have those two located right there. We will, we will definitely okay. look at whether or not those can be consolidated or in, in the best design. We want to make sure that we're, we're preserving all the good transit access that we have out there today. But and it could we'll be that there's, a, there's a, that there's two different routes, right? That one that goes west and goes right. up Ash, and then another one that goes west and goes right. up Farmer. Right. So there, there might be a really good reason for it. I, I just need to know that. Um, and the last... Uh, there's two more. One is, I, I know you guys had mentioned ride share. I'm really glad to see that you're incorporating some sort of ride sharing. Uh, uh, and the last one being is, oh, the palm trees. Do we have palm trees anywhere else on Mill Avenue? Uh, yeah, not on, sure. university. <laughs> well, university. we do on South Mill Avenue and we do on, we have oh, palm yeah. trees on Fifth Street in some, in some sections, obviously Mission Palms and some of the private developments further west. Um, the date, these would be the date palms that are, you know, historically, agriculturally relevant here. The ones and, on, on, on university and, and Palm Walk, yeah. So I, so I, I appreciate the cultural mm -hmm. side of it, but, uh, and I'm going to assume, I don't want to speak for you, but I'm going to assume that Joel agrees with me on this one, that there's a, there's a metaphor and a scheme for all of Mill Avenue, and it tends to be a certain kind of tree. And the idea of uh, introducing a brand new kind of tree to Mill Avenue that doesn't exist there I, I think it's just going to look weird, candidly. You're talking so it's not, you don't have, your concern is really just at Mill and Fifth. Just at Mill and Fifth. Now, if it's off Mill, but I mean, so that's right uh, next to the Starbucks, right? Yeah, it'd be on all, on all yeah. four corners, really, or right. all so, two sides of, the, of Mill. It just, it would seem very strange to me to walk down Mill Avenue and have palm trees <laughs> be in front of the Starbucks or anywhere like that. Um, it just seems odd. Uh, oh, and I, I did have one more that I'd forgotten, and that is, can you show one of the back-end parking spots? This? Uh, yeah, that's a perfect one. So, I, given the choice between protecting a person on their bike and protecting someone's car, I, I would go with the person on the bike. And so, my suggestion would be, if it's feasible, that you move the bike lane on the inside and move the car part on the outside so that... Uh, the cyclists are closer to the sidewalk, and the cars are protecting the cyclists, as opposed to the cyclists protecting the cars. So we back it into the cycle lane? Cycle? Yeah, because right now, every time someone backs out, they're going to back out into the cyclists. Uh, and then, back in and hit the cyclists. Oh, no, you'd put a curb there. You'd, you'd stop it. So there'd be something stopping it there. So that a person couldn't, uh, you know, so park works. in. Yeah, so you'd have some sort of protected thing so that people cycling uh, would be basically where the vegetation sort of is on the right picture. You might push the cars out into the street. Uh, well, it couldn't push the cars that far out because otherwise this would, this would cause the bikes to be pushed out, I think. Well, they're so on we, the street. Yeah, and we, we had a lot of discussions about this. There was, you know, we, the, 
it really was a discussion about whether or not you wanted a protected bike lane. Um, the, the street uh, has performed, we feel as a collector, it's different than some of our arterial streets, uh, performed really well with having that bike lane um, adjacent to the travel lane, so travel uh, speeds in the uh, traffic is moving relatively slow. Um, That's true. And then, so, so we didn't feel that it was, it was imperative to have a protected bike lane facility on this particular um, segment of street in the community. Okay. We, we did want to increase the visibility of it by adding that green the yeah. interval green. And I love um, how you and stagger then, the green rather than being the green the whole way. Yeah. yeah. Is there I'm any, I, I mean, I, I've had, candidly, I've never actually seen what I just described to you. Uh, <laughs> that was that, the other reason. It's, yeah. No, I mean, to be fair, I mean, much, is, is that even ever, has it even ever been done? I, we, we looked at your <laughs> cities. It's not, it's not very common. If it, if it has been done well, we didn't really see any good examples of it. Um, someone brought up, one of the council members brought up earlier the maintenance also. issues. It does create some maintenance issues yeah. and it does create some you know cross pedestrian conflict. Is this common? We, Have you seen this before? I mean, obviously it came from somewhere. Well, this well, is common. The configuration of the bike lane next to the angled parking is common, but the but the but buffered the lane right. on the you know on That's the back side of the parking next to the uh, sidewalk is not as common. It's not based on best practices. Have you seen any issues with this configuration? We've had we've had good results. I mean, what we've seen is is good results from other peer cities um, mm -hmm. that are doing this. It's a lower uh, traffic accident. Um, between bike and vehicle by doing this configuration. All right. That's good. All right. I'm all right with it. Council Member Shapiro, I'm sorry. Did you have something you want to? <coughs> I did, but I, I think... mean, I know you're over there debating something. No, no. I, what it is. I, had, I had something in mind, and then I just saw that Trump launched 59 Tomahawk missiles in Syria and kind of lost my train of thought. But, um, yeah, no, I think the Fifth Street looks great. I think, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a... Uh, you guys have done a great job. It's very exciting. I think this is going to become an, another kind of uh, iconic thoroughfare like we talk about Mill Avenue based on the hard work you guys have put in. Eric, I would ask you a question. How, how, um, how are you incorporating the DTA and the downtown businesses? And, you know, what, is, what does that look like? And what kind of involvement have they had through this process? So they've, they are, we have sort of a steering committee and we have representatives from DTA that have been on that, including uh, their director, Kate Borders. Uh, we've been giving updates to their board. Um, in fact, we gave one yesterday, gave them, gave them this, basically this presentation. Um, and then we're meeting with every property owner along the street. There are some that we have missed or haven't been able to, to contact, but you know, folks like Mission Palms, uh, Hanover, Starbucks, um, anyone that DTA, and DTA has been really active in working on this project to make sure it functions well for all of their needs and their merchants' needs. Um, so anyone that, that they come into contact with, we've been sitting down with them and, and talking to them. We want to continue that. I would just say a couple things too um, in regards to what I heard and especially the 5th Street and Mill. I mean, I really worry about traffic and I know we want to balance that out somehow between traffic and bikes, but the reality of it is is we're building a lot of different developments for, you know, homeowners, for offices. We have our own parking garage right down the street. So I really am worried if we eliminate any type of traffic capacity that we should really take a really good solid look at that. And if there's a way that we can incorporate some safety measures without adding any candlesticks to it, <laughs> I can really understand how that works. Um, and, you know, and I, I don't disagree with the palm. I wasn't thrilled about the palm trees because I don't like palm trees very much. And, but, but if the reason is so you can include that lighting element, I mean, to me, I think that's going to be pretty exciting and it's just going to really, you know, liven everything up. And the last thing I think is it would be really great if there's a way that we can, once this gets going a little bit more and we're a little bit more firm in what the design is, to really just let our community know how we're really trying to improve downtown so it is an experience for everybody. I mean, this is a really wonderful opportunity and we want everybody to be able to come downtown um, and experience it in their own way, whatever that may be, with their children or their friends. And, um, and I think this is going to be something that really will encourage more individuals to want to come downtown. And maybe it's an opportunity to, for us to really express where parking is Mm -hmm. Too, because I know parking has always been perceived as there is none in downtown Tempe, and sometimes I think that's just a negative perception. And if there's a way that we could talk of maybe even wayfinding signs within the design or um, why we're out there doing some marketing to let people know what we're doing, I think that would be really wise for us to incorporate that parking strategy. Right. Sorry, Councilmember Kubi. So, um, thinking that we got to get this right and it's an opportunity to kind of go big, have we explored at all the idea of solar roadways? If not the entire expanse, but sections of it, whether it be bike, bike lanes or the road, because 
there's a lot of benefits there, and there, there's a lot less maintenance, apparently. They actually can generate energy for an electric <coughs> car that's riding on them, which is really cool. And this is happening, this is around today. I mean, this exists now. And I don't know what the costs are, but there's a lot of, you know, besides aesthetic benefits, there's a lot of um, maintenance benefits as well. And they don't soften with the heat. And, anyway, so have you considered that? Do you want to yeah, say some words on that? Yeah. So I, I think that for the overall sustainability of the street, you want to be able to pick some goals that you really go bold on. And the thing that's great about this design is that Eric and Shelley and the team have done a great job on going bold on water and setting a very aggressive water goal and going bold on tree canopy. You can set aggressive goals for energy. A lot of cities haven't done that with streets, but you're right, solar roadways are an opportunity as well as solar shade structures on, on, on parking. Uh, Grace Kelly and I are looking at those options for streets and how we incorporate solar into streets, but everything we've looked at thus far is really expensive and very much in beta, in beta in terms of what we can accomplish. And so the Sustainability Commission has been working really hard to figure out how do we feature sustainability features where they really make sense, but also not put untested technologies or really expensive technologies that overburden a project. So. I'm, we're, I'm happy to continue to explore both solar ro roadway technology and solar street covering, and we're having a, a meeting next week on, on, on some of those issues with a, a potential vendor, but, but in terms of that fitting this concept at this time, we didn't feel totally comfortable doing that. I really appreciate you exploring it, though. That's good. Yeah, okay, sorry. Go ahead. sorry, Councilman. I mean, please. I realize the whole extent would probably not be realistic, but I wonder, mm -hmm. just in the same way that the ASU, the Global Institute of Sustainability, has has um, wind power on the roof. It doesn't really power that many of the computers, but it's meant to, it makes a statement saying, we are the convener of renewable energy on the Tempe campus. It makes a statement. And if there's an element where either it's, either it's an artistic element or, and a functional, artistic and functional element, maybe in front of City Hall, maybe it makes that same kind of statement, especially as we increase our renewable energy goal as time goes on, that we're, we're making a, a statement that's artistic and visionary. That's what I was thinking, is it may, it, Maybe it could be something that we would look at incorporating into that educational area, that, that civic space that we were talking about trying to establish outside of City Hall. Thanks. All right, good. Is there anything else? I think you, we... Uh, no, we just no. want to assure you that we will, be, we will be back to give you some more details on this project in, in several months, and, and uh, we are still planning on doing the test phase of some of, especially the, the right turn lane, but some of the, the key changes to the street. We want to simulate that, much like we did Broadway Road. Couple years ago, before we before we launched the construction of that project, and bring back that traffic information, that traffic performance information, to you, maybe fall of, of this year. So we'll be back. Well, I think we gave you enough direction. Are you good? Yeah, thank you. Crystal thank clear. You. All right, <laughs> thank you guys all very much. Really appreciate it. All right, next on the agenda, setting speed limits. I think we have Julian and Sergeant Curtis are here. They're still here. Are you still here? Way to hang in there. No, way to hang in there. On the edge of your seats for this one. So. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Council Member, um, or Vice Mayor Maradona Savage, and Council Members for having us here. My name is Julian Driesing. I'm the City Traffic Engineer. Sergeant Mike Curtis from the Traffic Bureau. And we are here to talk about speed limits. So uh, I'm going to begin by just quickly um, going over what we'll be talking about today. We're going to talk about a little bit of background about speed limits. <laughs> some of the goals of speed limits, um, the engineering factors that go into setting speed limits. Um, we're going to look for some feedback on study location criteria and then um, what that criteria actually uh, results in is some proposed study locations and then we'll finish up with some uh, discussion about the process for uh, moving forward and setting speed limits. A little bit of background, um, over time traffic conditions change and so uh, that could be a change in demographics, that can be a result of uh, redevelopment, uh, technology is really changing the way our system works, and so it's important for us to periodically review our speed limits and make sure that they're still appropriate. And so the last time we did that was 2007, so we felt uh, it's about time to take a look at them again. Um, we work closely with our police department. Uh, uh, speed limits are only as good as uh, the people that uh, pay attention to them and use them, and so an important part of that what our police department uses is education and enforcement, and they also provide us with crash data that we use uh, to try to make our streets safer. 
because the speed limits are in the city code, it does require um, any changes to uh, go through uh, the city council process with two hearings. Why do we have speed limits? Um, really, we have two goals with that. Uh, ultimately, it's safety. Um, the speed limits should be appropriate for conditions. Uh, an example would be that on an arterial street, 25 miles per hour probably wouldn't make sense unless you're going around a sharp curve. The speed limits should also be reasonable. Uh, just having a standard speed limit of 25 miles per hour or something for the city probably doesn't make sense. And then uh, when we're talking about safety, uh, speed is a major contributor in many of those crashes, and even more so is differential. So that's when you have um, different traffic traveling at uh, different speeds. And so we do the best we can to try to have some consistency on that side. And then the other goal is really driver expectation. Our drivers um, have an expectancy that there will be consistency and continuity as they're driving through the city streets. Here's a list of a lot of the study factors that we as engineers use when we're setting speed limits. I'm not going to read through all of them. Uh, I'll just touch quickly on the first one. That's the 85th percentile. We use that as a starting point, so we go out and collect actual speed data. And the idea behind the 85th percentile is that there's always going to be kind of 15% of the traffic that are going to ex exceed the speed limit no matter what we set it. We could set it at 100 miles per hour, and there's going to be a percentage that are going to go over that. And so we're really trying to target the, uh, the, the largest largest portion of the population that, uh, to set that speed limit. So that's um, the 85th percentile speed, and that's something that's used uh, across the country by professionals and uh, is the accepted kind of beginning point. And then from there, we look at these other features to decide if that's appropriate or needs to be adjust adjusted. So this is the criteria. Um, we can't study every street in the city, and uh, so we came up with these four criteria to decide on how we're going to do this um, studies and update to our speed limit plan. Um, the first being the high school 35 mile per hour zones. We had a resident speak earlier. And we get that uh, comment uh, fairly often. And uh, we just wanted to give the council the opportunity, if, if they'd like, to, um, to, to look further into that and see if that's still appropriate. Um, and we, from a transportation standpoint, we think that any time we can have the street at a lower speed from a safety, there's benefit to that, but we understand that there's other factors that play into that, and so um, we're definitely interested in getting your feedback on that. Uh, ultimately, we're really looking at trying to just find those little inconsistencies and discontinuities. An example of that is like arterial mid-block changes. Generally, the street doesn't change from a driver's perspective, so it kind of um, comes as a surprise maybe that the speed limit has changed at a mid-block. We tend to I think that that would happen at uh, the major <clears throat> intersections. And then uh, we added this last point to take a look at some of our recently completed streetscape projects, for example, University and Broadway, and see if uh, those changes have had any effect on speeds of traffic in that, those areas. So based on those uh, four criteria, this is the list of uh, locations. And on to the right is a map. Um, this slide shows the arterial locations. And then the second slide shows um, more the collector or smaller streets. All right, Councilmember Kubi. Absolutely. Maybe it's using to ask this question, but why aren't there any locations on McClintock for that proposed study location? I, th I think that the, the reason we're currently not looking at McClintock is we're going through a process right now to look at what the ultimate condition is for that, and we wouldn't want to make a change mm -hmm. and then have to change it again later. So I think um, that's not to say that at some point we can't go back. We can always go and relook at these areas. At, really at any time. So at the, no. we're not including it now, but it doesn't mean that we can not include it in the future. Because I had a really interesting conversation with David King, who's a geographer and transportation geographer at ASU. And he mentioned that he thought that the most important thing we could do for traffic flow in McClintock would be to um, make sure that you just have 23 miles per hour throughout the whole uh, light cycle. So you never once the light turns, you go 23 miles per hour and not stopping. And that would be the most effective and safe um, option for both riders and, you know, riders, drivers in terms of traffic flow and also bikers for being safer. Yeah, absolutely. One of the goals of this is to create that consistency and what that um, speed is can be difficult because drivers can only drive as fast as the vehicle in front of them and they're not always as fluid as, as that might be, but there is definitely an advantage to that and we can... Um, we can look into that. that. That would go for all our corridors, not just uh, McClintock, but 
Um, we do try to set that speed limit to be reasonable and try to move as much traffic. There's, there's obviously times of the day um, in the morning and in the evening peak hour where um, it kind of breaks down. We just have such high levels of traffic, but we can definitely look further into uh, that study. I, and I think you did provide some contact information. Julian, you'll, you'll be studying at least in front, the McClintock, in front of McClintock High School, correct? Yes, that's, that's part of our criteria yeah. is, the, is the high school. If, if, uh, well, if the council member chooses Navarro? to. So, so what, what direction are, are you trying to grab from the council? I, I mean, obviously the high school speed limits were brought up. And what, what, what was kind of the direction or proposal that you guys are getting? Sure. Um, I'll move. Can I answer? Oh, I'm sorry. Did I, did I, I thought we were. Like, jump right, right to the end. <laughs> no, it's <laughs> not quite there yet. Okay. Right, I'm sorry. So this is good. Let's get sure, to these no, slides. That's really. a great Go segue ahead. into uh, finishing this presentation. He already knows what he's got. All right, um, we're good. So th this is kind of the process that would move forward depending on the results of the study. So we would uh, develop some recommendations based on those. Um, we would present those to both the Transportation Commission and uh, the City Council. Uh, because it is uh, uh, a ca change, potentially changed to the Council Code or the city code rather, um, there would be a public hearing process with two meetings. We'd have a heavy education component. We're not out to, you know, uh, the, pur the purpose is not to raise money or to write tickets. We'd like to avoid that. So we want to have an education component. And then um, we'd fabricate, install the signs, and then continue that education component. And ultimately, at some point, there would have to uh, work with our traffic bureau for enforcement. Julian, did you mention streetscapes in there? Um, Only because I know Ernie came up a little bit earlier and he talked a little bit about the areas that had yes. those different streetscapes. I thought that was so, there. So, yeah, this is the council direction really that we're looking for is um, the criteria that we we that we're, uh, have identified to determine where to study. And so there's, these are the four listed again for you, the high school 35 mile per hour zones, locations of inconsistency, discontinuity, um, arterial mid-block changes, and then recently completed streetscape projects. So that Broadway Road project would be included in that fourth mm -hmm. bullet. Well, I think it's just kind of, it, and the one reason is because when you have your proposed studies locations, you, you don't really know why you're picking those ones. I, I don't disagree with the criteria by uh -huh. any means. I mean, I, I think that's totally fine, but that's why I asked because I was looking at the end game. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, so these locations on the map and listed on the slide and the, and the next slide are a result of those four criteria. Um, that's how we identified the locations circled here on the map and listed. So, so with the high school... I mean, it was all brought up, schools. yeah, all high schools, but it was brought up having a, a fluctuation in speed in that area, unless the speed is consistent at 35 continuously through that area. I mean, is that kind of the, the process of what you might be proposing, just continuous 35 throughout the area? I think what the idea behind the high, the high school zones is really to see what kind of compliance we're getting in those areas and see if, um, if they're... <laughs> If there's value, and we, we you know, we, we would bring that back and share the results of that. We don't um, really have that information, and so that's why we're studying further. But um, the, the concerns that we generally get from the public is it is 24 hours a day, seven days a week makes sense, and so we we hope with the data that we collect, we can get an idea of um, it, if if drivers are are, are heeding that and uh, taking that into account, or if there's certain times of the day where maybe um, that that is the case or not. Yeah. So. Um, we, we don't really know what the result of that is until we collect the data, and then we would obviously want to hear from council, work with all the school districts if any kind of change was recommended. Do we, uh, have we ever talked about signage location, where the signs go? And I always wondered that because I know we have some inconsistency with speed limits, which certainly needs to be addressed, but is our, where we locate the signs, is that consistent throughout the city? Um, probably not, <laughs> and, I, and there's probably room for... Um, uh, adjusting some of those, we typically uh, try to. We do follow certain guidelines about uh, spacing and, and such. But if that's an, a topic that uh, you guys would like us to look into, we definitely could do that. It seems like while we're out there working on it, it seems like something we should at least know or have the information about. So that, that's my two cents. I don't know. Councilmember Kubi, I know you. So and when you look at the study locations, will you be looking at presence and absence of bike lanes and um, the same? Uh, David King, I had a conversation with him, and he said there's a zone of 20 to 30 miles per hour, and people are hit out, outside of the vehicle, go from likely to be injured but live, that's at 20 miles per hour, to be likely to be killed, and that's at 30 miles per hour. So will, will there be consideration of which these study locations have bike lanes and don't? Because that could have an impact on what the limit should be. Absolutely. So that was one of the, uh, the criteria, that, and I, I know I went through it very quickly, but... Um, the third bullet from the bottom, pedestrian and bicycle yeah. activity, de activity definitely plays into that. But we still have to be realistic on driver expectations. So 
for example, a bike lane on uh, rural in South Tempe, uh, just because there's a bike lane on a portion of that facility wouldn't mean it would necessarily drop it down to like 30 miles per hour because we still have to set it at a, at a range that we could get compliance from drivers and um, still move traffic through the area. So it, it's a balance. It so we, um, we try to look through all of these, uh, you know, as engineers, we, uh, we have tons of things that we analyze. We can't analyze enough. And so here, here's a, a sample of those and uh, we'll work through that, uh, through the study process. And also, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Is there also a consideration for, um, for complaints about specific speed? We, we heard from a couple of residents tonight. How is that incorporated into the, the discussion? Is there, I mean, do you have a, keep a log of complaints you have about uh, travel times, different roads from residents? I mean, it's hard, it's hard, yeah. it's more like that's more qualitative and less quantitative information. But you know, tonight we've kind of asked you in a way to consider Broadway because we've gotten a bunch of emails about that. Are there other? locations that you've been hearing about that will be considered or is there aren't I can't really think of any others where we've gotten public comment back especially like a, at a large scale um, are you sure you haven't heard a lot about Rio Salado Parkway or anything like that the Rio Salado Speedway the Rio Salado Speedway <laughs> right yeah no. um, <laughs> I, I, we have a lot of streets where we have uh, mm -hmm. some issues with driver compliance and speeds, and so uh, we're, we're trying to use these criteria to try to narrow it down some. But, um, Will you take tickets? We, like, we, you take, we like to ticketing into consideration when you analyze those. Like, are there certain areas that receive more speeding tickets? Not currently one of our criteria, but because it's something that we could add if that's something you'd like us to look into. Well, I guess I think when you're analyzing the speed limit for a change. To just see if that's if that's impacted by that at all, you know, if it's yeah. like excessive ticketing in that area or no ticketing at all. We do keep track in for the neighborhood complaints uh, through the Sims unit. Uh, when citizens do complain, we do keep those and log those, and those are available for review. So, uh, in the study areas, we could provide those to traffic engineering. Councilmember Granville. Yeah, I, first of all, I think that's an excellent point. I mean, I remember when going six, seven years ago now, when there were the, the, the cameras, 90% uh, or 80% of all the tickets came from one camera, and that was the one northbound on rural by Rio Salado. Uh, I think the mayor at the time said it stuck out, it stuck out like a finger on the chart. Well, I got one there. Uh, <laughs> um, the thing I, I would add to this is, you know, the schools that we, I, I get a lot of emails about schools. I think we all get a lot of emails about schools. It doesn't really make sense sometimes. I would first and foremost defer to the school, right? If the school says, we really think this is a big deal. But I can tell you, at least where I teach, I don't know if I've ever seen anyone slow down for that school sign. Um, and every month or two, there's somebody who sits out there and writes tickets all day long. Um, but uh, I, I, I would want to, I, I think there's a real low compliance. And I bet at 1 o'clock in the morning, there's zero compliance. Um, so if there's a way to have dual times, if that's sort of a traffic engineering thing, uh, you know, after 9 o'clock or after 10 o'clock or whatever the case may be, um, or uh, there's got to be a way to, to come up with something. I mean, other cities do it, and it seems to be okay with them. Um, so if there is a way to take it a little bit into account, I think it's just not real. It's not an expectation people have when they go by a school at 11 o'clock at night, even though I understand there are nighttime activities sometimes. Um, the other thing that we've gotten in the way of feedback is the idea of doing some sort of striping in front of schools. Um, because right now, the only thing that tells you sometimes you're in a school zone is the sign that says school zone 35. Um, and to have some sort of uh, painted something, on, even on our material, to say like, you know, if you missed the sign, here's why you should slow down. Um, I think that would also uh, probably be a good use of time to investigate. We'll definitely look into that. Thank you. Well, I, I would say, though, too, even the, the schools vary a little bit. Like, I know the school you're referencing and where you teach is a little bit smaller school, so people probably don't know it's a school sometimes. No, you drive so by it all there day is long. a way to yeah. marker it, I get it. But I would, I also agree, I think it's really important to let the schools weigh in Absolutely. And, and see what their thoughts are in regards to that, because they may... Yeah. Yeah. If the school says 24-7, I would defer to the school. But if they think that there's a reasonable time at night, you know, and you don't have an issue with it, <clears throat> we would de we definitely plan on uh, if if any cha changes were to result from the study or propo being proposed, we would work closely with them to see uh, it, their their appetite for that or moving forward what that might look like. Any other thoughts for Julian, Sergeant Curtis? 
Oh, I think you guys have done a great job. It looks like a lot of work, so yeah. better start now. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> up there with the radar gun all day long. Get out there. <clears throat> all right, moving right along. Uh, letter to the governor regarding the Tempe Charter Amendment, Proposition 485. I think Councilmember Kuby brought this up, and we have a sample of the letter in our packet. Yes, we have a draft letter that staff um, has penned uh, to be sent to the governor upon uh, council approval. So as you all recall, Prop 485 was passed in March of 2016, the same, the same election cycle that Councilmember Keating was elected. And um, that proposition reduced campaign contributions, basically just to simplify for individual donations from $6,250 to $500. And over 88%, I think close to 89% of Tempe voters supported that ballot initiative, which went, it's supposed to be under our charter. So according to our charter and the Arizona Constitution, after the voters ratify and we canvass, and we canvassed and um, affirmed that vote on March 23rd, there is, uh, the governor shall approve, uh, shall approve an amendment um, if it does not conflict with the Constitution or the laws of the state. So it's been over a year, and the last time we had a charter amendment was our anti-discrimination ordinance. That was nine months, and, uh, but this has been over a year, and we have an election to take place in less than a year. And so it's very important to know the rules of the game for the upcoming election for any candidates that may decide to run. And uh, you know, the Constitution explicitly authorizes and gives charter cities the ability to regulate concerns that are local. That is a strictly local concern, and there's a lot of case law that shows that um, charter cities have real protections as far as elections, because they're local elections and they're a matter of local concern. And um, also the city of Tucson did uh, amend its charter previously to limit campaign contributions in 1986, and that hasn't been challenged. So this letter asked the governor um, politely to respond within 30 days um, of the letter, and since our elections are coming up, and asked the governor to um, approve our charter amendment. And so what we're looking for here is a consensus to move forward with the letter. The only change I would recommend is, I think it says, very truly yours as a signature, and I would just suggest we substitute sincerely, sincerely or respectfully, but it's very truly yours sounded kind of sweet. Thank you, Council Member, or uh, Vice Mayor Hernando Savage. Um, I have no problem moving forward with this letter. I think it's long over... Um, his approval of our charter amendment is long overdue, so let's move this forward. Uh, as far as the sign-off line, I would suggest maybe using respectfully submitted. <clears throat> I agree with that. Councilmember Shapira. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I, I agree with my <clears throat> colleagues. You know, not only is this something that passed with overwhelming support, but this provision is frankly archaic. I mean, it, it comes from a time when the population of this state was so small, the governor probably knew most of the people who voted on the on the ballot measure. Um, you know, this is this is just a, it should just be a formality, especially when something is so clearly a solely local municipal concern and our own city elections. I can't think of anything that is more clearly a local concern. And so I hope that the governor will, quick, will quickly uh, dispense with this by approving it and we can move forward. All right. Any other thoughts? Otherwise, I think we'll move forward and respectfully move forward. Does that sound good? Yep. All right, very nice. All right, we went right through that. The next item, respectfully, truly yours, <laughs> is a, a call to the audience. Is there anyone out there that would um, like to have a public comment in regarding section 4A or 4B? There is none on 4B, but we have two items for the Committee of the Whole. Anyone? Future agenda items. Oh, yeah, is there future agenda items? I was just moving right out of that. I did want to su suggest um, possibly two with your approval. And one is, uh, you'd be pleased to hear this mentioned, but looking at our food truck policy. Yes. <laughs> nom, see, nom, nom. Can that be the name of the are. committee? <laughs> <laughs> and, and knowing that we don't necessarily um, raise oh, many funds for food truck policy, but I've had a couple. Oh, may I have your attention, please? Sorry. 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 We're we've had a little. Food. We've had some feedback from, from some area businesses, and, um, you know, that it's kind of onerous and it's not easy to, to, to complete, and we want to maybe look at just what our food truck policy is and how we might modernize it. So if there's any, I know we have a really full schedule of issue review, so I don't know when that would be. Well, I mean, maybe what we could do is if we could put it, if it fits, Andrew, we could put it on a future agenda item. If not, we could at least send out the current policy in a Friday packet so we have the opportunity to review it that way, and then we can give some solid feedback. 
Okay. If we have when we have the opportunity okay, to bring six it. months old, right? I don't. Yeah, it might be older than that. It goes quick. It's like. Yeah, I think it's older than that, but I remember going through it. So. The sky building. Corey worked on it. Yeah. Yeah. And your second one? The other thing is, uh, you know, we have three new uh, commissions, and one the Veterans Commission that you were responsible for, and the Family Justice Commission and Sustainability Commission, and they all have a policy that you can become a member of that commission <coughs> if you if you live or work in Tempe. But there are other commissions that don't have that, that allowance. And I'm thinking about, in, in particular, the transportation commission. It, it seems, you know, we have so much daytime influx of population that that's a commission that would really benefit from maybe having somebody who has expertise, who may not live in Tempe, but works in Tempe. Uh, there's a lot of research potential. ASU people who live off, you know, someone's expressed interest in being on the commission, but they don't live in Tempe. But they, they have particular a unique expertise to bring to that the table, the commission. So I was just wondering if we could look at all of our um, commissions and just see where we are in terms of that policy and consider a uniform policy. And there's some commissions you want to have a requirement, like for family justice, you wanted to get people who are um, from an, you know, an NGO in a domestic violence um, NGO. And so you may not find that person in Tempe. And so one of the reasons we did that is for that reason. I but, completely understand. I mean, we did the same thing with the Veterans Commission. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Andrew. We didn't do it. We have, it hasn't been that long ago that we re, restructured the whole commission, and there was a study done in regards to how we downsized those, which now we've we did. We significantly expanded. I want to say 2013, I think. Was that possible for you to, to give you some direction to yeah, yeah, take a look at that and just see what right. that might look like and if we can create some consistency moving forward, or at least Specifically the, looking at... Mm -hmm whether or not residency should be a requirement for certain commissions. Well, I think she said residency or working in Tempe, so. But, wait, or, yeah. 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 but currently, I think right. all the commissions, with the exceptions of the, the one three, that the Councilman McCubey right. mentioned, say that Live. you have to be a, a resident, resident of Tempe. Sure. <coughs> Are we getting into discussing right now? No, I'm no, just clarifying just what it is you want me to bring back. If you, want me to, if you want staff to look at what potential committees we think, as staff, could be uh, ripe for Relaxing that rule, we could look at that. That's what. And also, nice. what that relaxing might be. It might be that they're limited. You can't can't have more than this many that yeah. live outside of Tempe. For instance, whatever. neighborhood advisory commission probably not, right? Probably not. Right. But maybe other ones. Yes. Part of that, could you look to see what other city, what some peer cities <coughs> do? Yes. For an outlier on that residency requirement or not? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and I would just say I would just do what's right for us too. I mean, yeah. what we want to do well, yeah, moving forward, kind of right? But it's kind of nice to see. Right. Go ahead, Councilman. Are we? Are does that mean we are putting them on a future issue review session agenda, or we're not? Well, I think Andrew is going to go ahead and um, work through that just a little bit, and maybe possibly bring back a recommendation. So we could probably do that, that at a future. Would, we would look at this. Mm -hmm. We would come back with some substantive memo that we present at a future IRS. Yep. Councilman Kibbe, did you still want either of those two things on an issue review session agenda? Well, you said you bring it back to IRS in terms of the... Um, I assume that's why she was asking. Yeah, yeah, back to IRS. right. But I'm, I am confused about the food truck because it might be, in a, would it be in a Friday packet? No, no, no. I, talk I thought it? what we would do okay. is just put the policy in a Friday packet so we had it, so we all knew what it was, and then when we're able to bring back uh, the yes, policy okay. to look at it in a future IRS, because I just don't know how long it's going to be till we can actually get it on the agenda. Well, I, I just know we're pretty loaded. Our calendaring ends, I think, in June of 2017, correct, uh, Kay? So we don't have any scheduled meetings after that point. So knowing when the next meeting is depends on the next time you come together and decide your calendar. I believe we have some capacity in the June IRS meeting potentially to add a couple of items, I think-ish. Well, no? I, well, I would trust that you I would look through that, Andrew. Loosely, apparently, maybe not as I mean, much I think as we want to put it on a, on a future agenda item at some yeah, point. Yeah, exactly. But I thought no, it right. would be good at least this way in, we could at least yeah, look at what the policy is in right now. In the interim, now. we can provide that policy for you right away, so you can review the policy, but with an eye towards right. putting it on a future IRS sure. agenda. And for maybe with items. some information of some other policies that have been used, you know, like Councilmember Granville said, in some other cities that have been successful, just with to give us some ideas. to the Boards of Commissions question. No, to the food trucks. And the food trucks. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That sound okay? Are you okay with that? Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Very good. All right. Now we're going to move on. Do you guys want to take a break? It says here I'm supposed to ask you if you want to take a break. Now we're super close. We're nearly done. Yes. No, we're good. No, no break for you. I just took one. Okay. Can I plug No break for you. All right. Uh, with the, a quick call to the audience. Deb, I see you. Been waiting patiently. Thank you so much. We, I appreciate, always appreciate your feedback, so thank you for being here and being patient. I didn't get my letter done in time, so I had to come in person. Oh. Um, I, I want to thank Joel, Joel when he left. He did. <laughs> <laughs> That's because I didn't allow him a break. That was completely on me. 
Um, <clears throat> um, for for holding the public meetings and and bringing in um, uh, he the meeting was handled well and there were very diverse opinions and so I, I really appreciate how the meeting went. Um, I like that the preserve is getting into the um, um, ordinance. Um, I ask that we because it's not a preserve yet, Popical Park is not a preserve yet, so there's always this risk that it won't be a preserve. I, I don't count my chickens before they're hatched, so could we word it to say natural desert parks um, and preserve? Because right now we only have a mountain. And I, I might have, I could. Yeah, go ahead, Councilmember Grant, I'm sorry. And maybe somebody else read it in greater detail. I thought when I read it, it said uh, Tempe Beach Park, Papago Park, and other preserves. Well, there's two sections. There's one that Rio is um, the, the Beach Park yeah. and Rio Salado, and well, then there's Rio another Salado. section that says um, preserves. Okay, I thought it named Papago Park by yeah, name. I may be misremembered. Um, no person shall launch or land a model aircraft within a preserve. Yes, yeah, yes. preserve. Yep, you're right. Anyway, yeah. and he's back. Now. You, you missed that. I said thank you very much. Uh -huh. I liked your meeting. You did a good job. It was a. a <laughs> A rough crowd it could have been and it was handled very well I appreciate it I mean I should I shouldn't say rough crowd it was very diverse opinions um, <laughs> for good conversation Deb anyway mm -hmm. pardon that makes for good conversation yes it does yes. Good thank dialogue. you I appreciate it um, anyway so um, if if we could could say natural desert park um, just in case the preserve does not occur um, and that would include Nat, um, Evelyn Holman Park, which I, I don't think that's in the preserve, um, but it is a natural desert park. So um, I, we do get a lot of, there's an island there that is nesting grounds to a lot of, um, there's, there's egrets, heron, cormorants, um, three different kinds of heron actually, small, medium, and large. Mm -hmm. And we recently this year have osprey. Now I don't know exactly where they're nesting, but we actually have osprey that fly over the park. So um, there, there, there are areas in the park. I mean, a couple years ago or a couple weeks ago, we had a racing one riding in Evelyn Holman Park. I mean, they go really fast, and I could see where that would disrupt natural animals. Well, I think we um, can certainly look into that. Anyway, I, I think we know what you're. Yeah, to what you want to try just, to consider. Just for clarity, you're you're just trying to incorporate Evelyn on Holman Park into the preserve. Um, As... I'm just I'm trying to make sure that number one, what I don't want to count my chickens before they hatch. The preserve is not done. It 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 still has a, a ways to go. I've been attending the parks meetings. It has a ways to go. Um, so, I I until that occurs, if we put in natural desert parks and preserves, that would cover both. I don't know that there are any other I was going to say, I think we'd have to parks. just look and see if that's even really a technical Trevor category yeah. or, uh, uh, but we can okay. certainly look into that. That's, okay. that's a, I thank you, thank you for bringing that up. That's if a really I good can point. help with anything, let me know and I really appreciate good. your consideration. Thank you, thank yeah. you for being patient okay. and staying thank here you. all night with us. Only about an hour more. Yes. Actually, well, sorry, well, I'll wait till we get to that yeah. item. Yeah. Okay. All right. We are to that item, actually, but okay. I will go ahead. The committee of the whole items now. Joel, I believe this one is yours. The unnamed, 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 unmanned aircraft regulation. Thank you, Council uh, Vice Mayor Erdogan Savage. Yeah. The, so, long story short, and, and if you guys read the uh, information in your packet, mm -hmm. um, obviously this has been going on for about a year or more, uh, trying to craft something that was uh, for Tempe and when we talked about unmanned aircrafts. Obviously through the process, the uh, FAA and the state have really kind of taken a hold of this, which uh, actually re really accomplished what we wanted to do. Um, and with the state and the FAA guidance, um, it kind of controls, you know, how uh, 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 UAVs can be used, um, where they can be used at, and um, uh, how to be used, and all, all and, and in incorporation with the, with the state law. So, with that being said, it it was really, and we had some great feedback. We uh, Tavco um, took this discussion on, went to those meetings. Uh, they voted on a six zero against the need for any ordinance. Uh, we had a neighborhood discussion. It was very robust, um, uh, well attended, 
and some great questions. And uh, to be honest with you, uh, it, it uh, really kind of, I think, solidified a lot of stuff um, when it came down to what, what the rules and regulations are. Uh, and, and it really kind of also protected the, and I know we're talking about the Desert Park area, but with the FAA guidance, uh, flying around five mile radius of the airport, uh, you have to go through an FAA approval uh, to, to fly an unmanned aircraft uh, in that area. So there is guidelines under that. And then state law kind of gets the reinforcement. And uh, just recently I was in the, uh, for the Final Four, they had the uh, EOC going on and I was part of that and, and we had some unmanned aircrafts in fact uh, where they were holding the concerts it was weird the, one side of the uh, uh, stage you could fly the unmanned aircraft and the other side of the park you you could not um, and so it was kind of in that five mile radius uh, so they had one issue and 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 obviously they, they caught them and and uh, they had the state regulations but the man or the individual was in compliance and and uh, that was about it um, so there is, with the state reinforcement, and from what I understand, the FAA is not going to enforce this. The FAA is just kind of regulating it, saying yay or nay, you can fly or not in the fly. But the state uh, actually has the enforcement aspect of it. So with that being said, um, with all that going back and forth, uh, I would suggest that, and I, and I understand trying to protect the deserts, um, but I do believe still with the FAA guidelines, we're still in that area. We're still in that area. Everyone has to comply. Um, to, to, to those things. Council Member Granville? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so first off, great work. I know this is something you've been working on a long time, and, and you know, I appreciate it coming back and you hashing it out with residents and sorting that out. Um, one, two, one or two questions. Number one, is there a way that if we ever, because you know, drone racing and all that stuff is catching on, and there are people that, uh, you know, that, that aren't doing it willy-nilly. It's their business or it's their whatever, right? They do pictures of buildings being built on Town Lake or something. Is there a process where if we wanted to attract an event or, uh, or we wanted to have somebody do drones for a commercial purpose for, you know, the as, you know, fly over the lake or construction of a building, where they could get some sort of permissions for that? Yeah, so, it, and once again, the, the uh, tower will regulate that. So it, it depends on how, who's flying, what the purpose of the... Well, but right now this says they couldn't do it at all because it would be a Tempe Beach Park. But here, here's the caveat. <laughs> so you, Tempe Beach Park, you can actually still fly over it. You just can't land or take off Oh, from Tempe okay. Beach Park. So I can go across the street and still fly my drone you over like there. Launch it at Monty's and fly it over there. Right. So is there, okay. So, and I don't want to hold this up because I know you've been, you come back once and I appreciate you going to get the feedback. If you could just, whenever we get it back to council, have some answer from staff or they can just circulate an email about what would happen if we wanted to solicit uh, some sort of special event at Tempe Beach Park or something like that, how there'd be, a, if, if there could be a process for that. Um, and then the other one is, I think the easier solution here is, uh, I, I tend to agree with the, uh, the issue related to Papago Park, but I mean, it's, it's one space, so you could just swap out, you could just name it in the ordinance, right? Um, and that way you're not worried about it being natural preserve and what is a natural preserve or a, like, you don't have to worry about all the weirdness of it, right? ADOT PID is technically a natural preserve um, because we don't do anything to it, uh, depending on what your definition is. So I think just name Papago Park right in it. Well, I think, didn't you say that was already covered in there? Or? Yeah, well, it, it's covered by the FAA. Well, and I mean, the, the, well, I'm sorry. Specifically, the five mile radius okay. is going to cover that area. It's going gonna, it's gonna to cover the town lake is a no fly zone or a fly zone that has to be approved by the FAA. But I, I think to your point though, because of what I've, I said, I still can go across the street from Papago Park and fly in Papago Park, but I can't take off and land in Papago Park. So that's... So I'm confused. So five miles around the airline's a no fly zone? Is, is, without is approval. approval. Without so, approval. So I don't know my distance is too well, but five miles from... Uh, the, it, it, it goes almost to Scotso Road. Yeah, I mean, it's gotta be everything. Right, that's what I'm saying. And it, 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 south, it goes almost to, I want to say almost to Quans Park. It does go to Quans Park. Yeah, so, so I, mean, it, I, don't it takes, the, I don't think this statute does any harm, but I'm not sure what it actually does. It just basically has a, for anybody who's a drone operator, and, and, and it's not going to encompass the, the kids. So well, keep, in mind, the also, keep in mind there's also a park on Chandler Boulevard. There's that, uh, whatever, the, like way down by the Chandler Mall, east of the Chandler Mall, there's an airport there too. 
So if you take five miles from there, I think we've covered all of Tempe. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it just, but there, here, here comes the, what we talked about. You got the, yes. yeah, you got the drone users, the ones that have the big commercial or the hobbyists, they have the real nice size drones. And then you got the ones you buy at the store. Uh, the kids use and stuff like that, and they're flying around. I mean, they, they do have the camera ability and, and to do neat things, but they're not, probably not the high end. More than likely, because of state law, and, and if they don't, uh, th this is where, yeah, they would, they would be required, depending on the drone, um, and when I say it was the, uh, the size and the weight of it, were required by, to, to be uh, 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 approved by the FAA to fly in that zone. If I get like a little plastic one, I assume I don't, I don't have to be outside of five miles of an airport. No, and, and it doesn't hit a height or any of that stuff either. Okay, so it's a height, weight, something like that sort of criteria. Yeah, exactly. So okay. um, with that being said, then the state law just basically, and so it listed out on the page, and it kind of says nuisance, uh, you're trying to hurt someone, you take your drone, you drop a, you know, whatever, terrorist activity or anything like that. Obviously, the state law is going gonna, is gonna to take care of that. The, the hard thing that, and this is through the discussion, is, how do you get PD responding enforce and enforce it? They're not going to enforce yeah. federal law. Yeah. 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 So, you know, with all that being said, it's it's case by case. It's it's going to the enforcement's there if the, if it's actually being witnessed and seen, then they can enforce it and do something about it. An example was the concert down at the Final Four. They saw a person flying the drone. Uh, they identified where he was at, and they immediately went to him and said, "You cannot fly the drone here." He took it down. That was it. Um, what what are the rule under the federal rule? Under under the federal and state rule, because he was in the flight zone and he was in the in a in an area where you can't fly drones, because they the flight the FAA said you can't fly drones in this concert area. They already made it clear at the day of the concert. And I, I, then the statute would then cover a smaller like if somebody had done that with a smaller drone. <laughs> so with a smaller drone, it would then it, it, it technically that they probably wouldn't have gotten the FAA approval for a little kids drone. But if they were flying it around and in that concert area, it would still be a no under state. It would be a nuisance flying over crowds, mm. whatever they had to say. No, you can't do that because the state law says these things. Okay. Joel, did you ever think you'd know so much about drones? No, and there's it was a lot more to go. In fact, Phoenix is actually as they start with the enforcement process, there's nuances to it because they go through the state system instead of the federal system first because of actuality, and in actuality, you're going to get more substance out of the state than you will out of the federal. So how does PD feel in regards to enforcement of enacting this ordinance? They, they were supportive of it. Obviously, they know that there are challenges with it, for sure. Councilmember Shapiro. Um, thank you, Vice Mayor. Yeah, I, I was just pulling this up, and I think Greg might have been doing the same thing back there, but so five miles from the end of the runway at Sky Harbor actually reaches all the way to McClintock and Broadway. So they, are you to, on the blow up of Just what? to give you some perspective. So I'm just on Google Maps. They have this tool where you can measure distances. So I measured the distance from the end of the runway to McClintock and Broadway, and it's actually five miles. Yeah. So, uh, so that, that encompasses a whole lot of the city. Yeah. If you rotate this way, you're all yeah. the way to southern, almost to the 60s. Yeah, if you rotate around, it includes all of Papago, uh, certainly all of Beach just Park. So, give us some more leverage. Yeah, it does give us more leverage, but to incorporate, if it, if it name it the Papago Park, we can take a look at that, and I'll take a look at that to see if that's something that's okay. reasonable. Okay. Any other concerns? Park, are, are there the way, any yeah. other concerns with, with Joel moving forward with the ordinance? That he's got to, we're going to look into the park yeah. and see if there's something that we can incorporate. Yeah. Council Member? Yeah. Yeah. The sorry, you, no, uh, oh, but. I'm sorry. Um, great work, Joel. This is great. Just relying on <laughs> your vast expertise. Thank you, and thank you for all the public engagement. Uh, I just noticed a couple things about the ordinance independent of the drone, um, the drone amendment. And one is, um, it seems, let's see, let's go to section two, section 23, 110, number three. It contradicts, there's a line there that contradicts our e-bike ordinance. Because right now, what it says, the old wordage says, or it says, no motorized vehicles shall be allowed in a preserve. And so that contradicts our e-bike ordinance, which allows um, e-bikes to be used in a preserve or desert parks, but just doesn't allow the motor to be engaged. So you can ride an e-bike, you just can't engage the motor. You have to just use the pedal assist. Yeah, so that, I don't know if we want to... That's another David. conversation. <laughs> no, I, know, I know it is, but if we're going to move this forward, we might as well make other changes to update it for... Well, maybe the maybe the maybe there it's not on the agenda, but maybe it's mm -hmm. hey, why we're if we move forward with updating the ordinance, we should just make sure it's all completely updated with other things that we may have changed. 
How do we uh, possible? Yes, it certainly is. I'm, I'm taking notes of your concern and we'll definitely address it through our office. Fantastic. That would be great. And can I make one other point that on, um, let me go back to the section. It is section one, section 23-40, prohibited activities, and it's um, five. It says no person shall use any water source, blah, 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 for animal swimming or bathing. And I know we're talking a lot about revitalizing our parks and having animal washing stations and perhaps having a swimming feature, you know, so it seems to me like that. I mean, we could always revise that later, but I didn't so know that we designated prohibited. designated for such Pardon? activities. What? It says except at places designated for such activities. Oh, okay, that covers that. And then just incidentally, the one above it, you're not allowed to ice block or sled no. in your parks? Is that? Awesome. Uh, I've got no warning on the ice blocking. <laughs> Let me tell you what, they take that rule seriously. not happy now. <laughs> Well, and I think anyway, really, honestly, whenever we, whenever we do any changes to an ordinance, we should always be yeah. able to review it and just sure. make sure that if there has been some changes that we're just consistent. Especially if we have an opportunity. Motorized yeah. vehicles, because that's in contradiction. Any more questions for Joel? Are we good to go ahead and move forward and look yeah. about um, Papago Park and Evelyn Hallman mm -hmm. Park? Okay. Yes. All right. That sounds good. We'll be seeing that soon. We're going to just move on to our next agenda item. Joel? Yeah. Richard okay. Park. Bridge Park. So, from the last council meeting, um, we. <coughs> <clears throat> we talked about Birch Park on, on the possibilities of uh, what could happen to it as it relates to the um, streetcar um, coming around the corner, and, um, and it really kind of ties in well today. I mean, obviously, it was brought up um, even by uh, our former mayor about, you know, what and how iconic damage is in the structure and the architectural design and having cables there and stuff like that. Um, this this kind of coincides with that a little bit. It's more of the enhancement of that area. Um, and then using what we know we can use as, as impact fees um, from the development around that area to help um, that park really be enhanced. And, and one of the thought processes as we tear up streets and as we start um, to put the streetcar in, the opportunity to um, work on a park is also there. So you're kind of taking advantage of what's going on in that area um, to lessen some nuisance. And in addition to that, yet we have a potential opportunity to have a, a park that's somewhat utilized and to incorporate parking um, uh, and then the, to incorporate possible designs with a, a minor street configuration um, for traffic flow to uh, possibly make it even more effective and better use of the land. So you know from the last council meeting um, it was suggested that we could probably you know get by with about 10,000 maybe $15,000 to just take a look at the design to see what is actually there. It wasn't clear on the council um, from what we're gathering or what I gathered. I thought the direction was to do that, um, so that's why it's back here tonight. Um, but to actually just kind of say yes uh, through the parks uh, or through Public Works, they could take some funding um, and possibly uh, about ten, fifteen thousand dollars just to really take a good hard look at this, look at the designs, look at the options that are out there, and get a neighborhood feedback on it. And I think uh, with the timing and the streetcar. Um, I would not want to miss that opportunity, and I'm um, just asking for the council to, for that approval for that money to go that way. Questions? Anyone? <clears throat> Councilmember Randall? So I, I don't want to be the buzzkill on this one, but I, I, yeah, when I, I struggle with this one because I, mm -hmm. I remember we've had I've had a couple instances where I've been on council where it's like, well, we're not spending money, we're just doing a study, and then when the study comes back, it's worded by the staff presentation as if we are moving forward and they're showing it in a budget and they're doing stuff and they're like, well, we just wanted to see what it looked like. Um, and so I'm, I'm a little gun shy at this point um, of having had that happen two or three times. Um, additionally, I didn't see, and maybe I missed it, I didn't see that, uh, that you did do neighborhood feedback yet. And that was one of the things that we'd asked in our last meeting. Right, and, and, and from, from what I'm gathering, I think the neighborhood feedback was going to be coincide with the uh, possible design concepts of what the park would look like so that they can have neighborhood feedback on with. Yeah, so, that, so my concern with that is once we show pictures, uh, it creates expectations. Uh, and so my preference would be, and I'm not saying no, I'm just saying first go get, talk to the neighborhood without drawings so that you're not expectation setting. Because if they see a drawing, they're going to think like, oh, we're seeing a drawing. It must be moving forward. Uh, and then if they say, you know what? Yes, we'd like something. We, and you know, maybe all you've got is 10 bullet points of what they want. Um, then I would feel a lot more comfortable saying, OK, now that we know that the neighbors 
are interested. Now let's talk about what they might be interested in and what it might look like. Member Shapiro. Uh, thank you, Vice Mayor. You know, I, I kind of felt like when we created the work group, we, we were saying we wanted to do something there. And I actually don't have as big a concern as to, to go going to the neighborhood and saying, you know, here's some ideas of some things and we want to see what you thought, your thoughts are. I mean, I don't know. I realized we hadn't taken a vote on, you know, dedicating resources or making renovations in the park, but we did, I think, create the work group, at least from my perspective, <clears throat> under the idea that we did want to do something there. And, and, and if, these, if we come up with some designs and take them and get their feedback, I'm comfortable with that, my perspective. Councilmember Keating? Um, I agree with Councilmember Shapiro on, on that aspect of it. I think it would be hard to get neighborhood feedback without some sort of conceptualization of what the possibilities may be. Seeing is believing um, a lot of times, and I think we just kind of had that discussion around the the, the on-wire, off-wire aspect of the uh, the streetcar. You know, I think that, you know, the mayor said it himself that if people really saw like what it was going to look like on mill, that they might not have an objection to putting it in that, that parking lane. So I think that it would be, make sense to move, move this forward um, as planned. Did you have anything? I just think it's a great opportunity, a streetcar, too. A great opportunity to look at it at the same time, and we shouldn't miss that opportunity. I guess I will just say I don't disagree. I mean, I think it could be something really phenomenal, and the and I think we just have to know what the feasibility is. I have no idea. I mean, that park has been really underutilized as long as I can ever remember. My only thought would be is I know it's going to come out of um, even if it's just fifteen dollars for the design and some re fifteen thousand. Fifteen thousand. Let's do five Don's of got point some really zero, good zero, contracts. And it's only fifteen dollars. But uh, I'm just wondering, is are those dollars um, already allocated for something else, and are we line jumping at all to make sure that I just want to make sure that we're not funding something to fund this? And if we are, what is it? Because I think that we should at least take that into consideration. That's and, and Donna, if you want to just if you can speak briefly on the possibility of where that might. Come from. I, I think it could be. I mean, I think it could be something really phenomenal, especially with the streetcar coming. It'd be great. Vice Mayor, Council Members, Don Dessler, Public Works Director. Um, the way the uh, memorandum was written uh, from the working group, this was to use, uh, recommended, I believe, to use park impact fees. But I'm correct with that, I believe. So park impact fees, we collect them. We have about 300 and some thousand dollars of them collected. In this year's current adopted CIP, none of those are allocated to any projects. They need to be allocated specifically to certain kinds of projects that are included in the IIP. Birchard Park would qualify under the rules associated with park impact fees. In next year's CIP, so the draft CIP that Ken Jones has been presenting to you on behalf of the city manager, there is a project, I don't recall the exact name of it, but it identifies park impact fees as one of the sources of funding, and it's that recreational value one. So under the idea that you would be looking at recreational value or doing something with Birchett Park, that would be another way that you could do it. Really the two ways if you use park impact fees would be wait until the uh, draft CIP that's been in front of you goes through its process and you vote on it, or direct staff to come back with some way to, the, the language to allocate money from uh, fund balance or um, well, fund balance essentially, spending authority and fund balance to fund this project. And it would have to happen in a regular meeting. What did you just say? Like, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> There's two ways that you could access park impact fees this year. Well, one this year and one next year. One way would be to work this through the park, the CIP process that's in front of you. And there's a, a project that's in there that has park impact fees in it. And this project could qualify under that project. But you're talking about next year's. Yes, the, so, so July So you're one. saying right now we have three hundred thousand dollars that are not allocated for anything in the budget. But are they earmarked for a project for next year? They're earmarked for park future park IIP projects. But not the whole three hundred thousand. So the capacity. You use in a variety of different ways okay, fine. as long as it's in the so IIP. What do I need to know? Okay, Council Member Grandma. Yeah, that's the part because I know before Vice Mayor Erdogan and Savage and I were pretty adamant about this shouldn't cause other parks to not get done, and so I was unclear if an impact fee can only be used for an expansion or if it can be used for maintenance and upkeep. So if we wanted to redo some existing park that was already sort of scheduled, this is money that could be used for that, even though that's not an, a system expansion. 
No, that's no. okay. Good. You had it all right until that part. So the it, end it needs part. to be for adding ex essentially expansion or so could it capacity. Be a new, so could it be a new, a second playground in an existing park, but not a replacement of a first playground? That's a great example. Okay. Okay, I think we're good. All right, with that, everybody good? Yes. All right, go forth. Joel, excellent work. Thank you for everything that you do. Very nice. Um, I don't think we have any new items. Is there any updates in progress that people want to talk about? Oh, fine. Sorry, dog. <laughs> Member Shapira, what do you got? Um, paper. So this is, it's actually paper you've all already gotten, and hopefully read. Uh, mm -hmm. This was an update we got from our staff on Arts, Arts in the Parks and just wanted to bring it to the council's attention that our, our whole idea of, uh, you know, maybe just going straight out and buying the stage May, may not quite be viable or, or may not be the best route. We'll just say that. And so uh, our staff is requesting that we go kind of back to the original plan okay. or they're suggesting that we go back to the original plan, which is to, you know, use the $25,000 budget to include the rentals and everything, uh, including stage rentals. And that's, that's if the uh, recipients of the grant wanted a stage, because it's not necessarily that all of them wanted a stage, but uh, if, if they have a stage in their plan, they would just do it out of that grant amount instead of us buying a stage. And then at the end of the process, if we figure out the stage is viable, we can buy a stage. If you're curious about the viability issues, one of the big ones is, you know, we have water retention in most of our parks, and they were concerned about those drivable stages, driving it down into the water retention and the potential issues there. If we do rentals, we're going to have some experiences of, of driving some stages down there and we'll get to see how that works and uh, get a better sense before we commit to buying and building or build and or building something. So I just wanted to provide that update, make sure everybody is okay with that plan. Sure. Yep. Yeah, that's good. This any other updates? No? Andrew, any announcements? Yeah, not, thank you. The mayor, he has no announcements either. All right, with that, our next meeting date is April 27th, 2017. Thank you so much, everybody. We are adjourned.